Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, 13th Age. Uh, I'm going to be your GM. My name is Aaron Radwish. I am the uh, online play czar for Fire Opal Media. And uh, if we could have everybody go and introduce themselves. Uh, Wade, why don't you go ahead and start? Sure. Uh, I'm Wade Rocket. I'm a community relations manager for 13th Age and Pelgrane Press. I also do some uh, work for Cobalt Press. And I am the author of this month's 13th Age Monthly Adventure, uh, Temple of the Sun Cabal. All right. Uh, Suzanne, I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody else that's been watching it knows you, but why don't you go through the motions anyway? Hey, guys. I'm Suzanne Wallace. I'm the brand manager for Roll20, and you are tired of seeing my face. But too bad, because I'm excited for this game very much. All right, uh, Nadja, why don't you go next? Hello, I am Nadja Otikor, a.k.a. Trista Ray. I am the DM for Miss Click's D&D Prophecy, and I just played in the 5th edition campaign that preceded the previous two panels. So, hi again. All right, and last but not least, Adam. Yo, I'm Adam Koval. You know who I am. Uh, I'm GM in residence for Roll20, author of Dungeon World. I do a bunch of other stream-related RPG stuff. And uh, I've run 13th Age before, but I never got to play it. So I'm looking forward to being on the other side, the more obnoxious side of the table. And trust me, my character is obnoxious. You just wait. <laughs> That's okay. I, I, I might have to kill characters with cows from space, but, you know, I hope I don't have to. <laughs> See, my, my players think that my side of the screen is the more obnoxious one. I guess it depends on exactly how you how you run things, but but we'll see. So, uh, Wade, as resident PR person, why don't you uh, explain to everybody what Thirteenth Age is? Sure. Thirteenth uh, Age is a tabletop role playing game by uh, Rob Hainso, who is the lead designer of Fourth Edition D and D, and Jonathan Tweet, who is the lead designer of Third Edition D and D. Uh, they've been best friends for about fifteen years, and they have the opportunity from Pelgrane Press to design the D20 rolling fantasy adventure game that they would most want to run for their own friends on game night at Wednesday night. So the result is um, a very familiar kind of D20 fantasy experience, uh, but there are a lot of story driving mechanics that are kind of inspired by indie role playing games as well. Um, some of which we have used to create our characters today, such as icon relationships. You, know, you have relationships with the uh, most powerful beings in the setting, and you can draw on those for resources um, throughout the game, and they embed you in the setting in a very interesting way. Uh, backgrounds, which describe your character's personal history in a way that is also a free-form skill system. And the one unique thing, which lets you say, my character is the only whatever in the world um, and it could be anything from I am the only human paladin in the, in the world to I am the illegitimate child of the Lich King and I'm destined to end the age so yeah that's 13th age in a nutshell alright sounds good And so let's introduce our characters and then we will get right to it uh, so Wade why don't you go ahead and start first since you're already on the flow well speaking of human paladins uh, I am <laughs> Enzone the Unlucky, a human paladin who started life as a thieves guild enforcer, uh, joined the Imperial Army to avoid going to prison, and ended up fighting in the Elf Dragonic War, uh, during which I was a prisoner of war uh, of an icon known as the Three, which are three evil scheming dragons. Um, after the war ended, I discovered that I am the only human participant in the war who actually remembers it. That is my one unique thing. The elves and the dragons do, but for some reason, I'm the only human who remembers it happened. All right. Uh, Suzanne, why don't you go into your character real quick? Uh, I am Dolores von Vagabond. Um, I am a, let's see, I am a halfling rogue. I couldn't remember if I was halfling for a second, but I am. Um, I, I yeah. <laughs> They're little, they're easily forgotten. Um, I became a thief at a young age. Um, I always wanted pretty things. I was sort of lower class, kept seeing those shiny, bejeweled nobles and wanted their stuff. So I trained myself to become a jewel thief and even through imitation and study over time, learned to hold myself as a noble 
although my only possessions are things that I've stolen. Uh, learn to infiltrate uh, fancy parties to steal necklaces and jewels and watches off of unsuspecting nobles. And um, I'm also a thief of hearts because one way to infiltrate such parties is to get invited by someone wealthy who's very handsome too, maybe. Um, my one unique thing is that cats either love me or they really, really hate me. So <laughs> I was like, yes, that'll be fun. No middle ground. Uh, all right, Adam, why don't you go into your character? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm leaving. I'm leaving lots of space to fill in for my character. I'm just a, uh, an outline right now. But uh, I'm playing uh, Thrandir Thrandarian of the noble house of Thrandarius. Uh, I'm a high elven wizard. Uh, I used to be a prince of the elves, but uh, I pissed off my girlfriend, the elf queen, and she was like, "Not nah, get out of here." It's debatable whether or not she was actually my girlfriend. But I tell people that. Um, and uh, after being exiled from, from the kingdom, uh, I've been uh, experimenting with magic. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of going for like a Timothy Leary of Elf Wizards vibe. Um, and uh, yeah, my, my one unique thing is uh, as the result of some magical self-experimentation, uh, I, I can taste magic. It's a, it's a thing that I do now. All right. And Nadja, who is your character? I am playing the dwarf barbarian Hildebrand the Gilded. I was a miner for a long time. I would often get drunk after work, get in fights at the bar. Uh, people started laying money down on it, and I realized there's way more profit to be made in pit fighting. So I kind of did the underground fight circuit. was very successful. Um, and I wear all of my winnings braided into my beard, uh, hence the gilding. Yeah, you can hear me coming because I rattle and jingle with all of my bling. And I go, <laughs> under, <laughs> I go under the fighter name Hilda Guild. Sweet. Awesome. Okay. So you guys are all working together. We decided earlier that you're working for an icon right now called... Uh, the Prince of Shadows. He is a rogue and nefarious uh, and mysterious figure uh, who drives the authorities mad with his thefts, assassinations, uh, basically anything on the dark side of things he's kind of got his fingers into. And you guys are have managed to get in his debt in some way or another. And uh, you've been brought together to pay off that debt. Um, do any of your characters know each other from before, or are all of you entirely uh, new to one another? Um, I figure Hild Hildegild and I probably <laughs> probably are buds. I probably I probably been betting on your shit for a while. Maybe maybe wherever the last place you got kicked out of was like my fault. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And anybody that would know about underground pit fighting has at least heard my name. Yeah, word. Probably true. I wonder if Anselm and I have come into contact. I am absolutely sure we've come into contact, given that we both have connections with the uh, thieves' guilds and organized crimes. Yeah, yeah. So perhaps we've worked together in the past. Perhaps we're friendly competitors. That uh, We don't talk about that job often. Um, <laughs> we, just, we just barely pulled it off, and not everybody made it. Things happened. Things happened. As they do. So through the Prince of Shadows, uh, you've been directed to head to an era, to a, a part of the Empire uh, called Greenwater uh, as part of uh, near a, a enormous swamp called the Knee Deep. And what, from what you know, uh, the fishermen there have dug up or, or fished up, as it were, uh, an artifact of some sort that is of great interest to uh, the Prince of Shadows for some reason. You don't know what the artifact is. They haven't told you what it is. Just that you need to go down here, pick it up, bring it back to uh, Shadowport, and then your debt, at least for now, is square. So... Um, 
you've at this point you've been traveling for probably uh, a week and a half, two weeks, very nearly. As you go farther west, out of access, uh, the ra- the roads gets uh, less common. the The paths become uh, less uh, well maintained. Uh, it's more and more wilderness with fewer and fewer uh, places to stop with a warm bed and a warm meal between uh, uh, between you and your tar- and your goal. Um, cold rains have made it feel like the swamp has been growing ever, ever further in your direction. But at this point, you're, you're pretty sure that you're close to, to Green River and at the very least, probably a warm meal for the night. Uh, somewhere around midday, you're making your way through the swamps. You're, it's cold, it's unpleasant. Uh, you're tired of, of going through this. When out of uh, one of the, the ragged trees, you see a number of figures heading your way. They seem to be moving with a, a strange sort of gait. It's not a, the, the figures appear to be humanoid, but they're not moving, they're not walking or even running like you'd expect uh, a person to do. Um, Would you say they're, are they, are they, are they shambling? Would you say, is it like a shamble? No, no, not a shambling. It's more of a, a bounding kind of gait, more of a, a, a lurching kind of thing where it's uh, very quick and then slow and then quick and slow again. Oh, they're trying not to attract the shy halud. I see. Okay. Yes, they walk without the rhythm. Um, is it, it could could this could this gait be described as hopping? Uh, yes, that is definitely a a way that you could describe this particular gate forget it kids it's chinatown let's get out of here <laughs> um uh you uh, the there's not enough sun to really see them but as they get closer you hear a, a p- peculiar kind of sound you've been hearing frogs and toads ever since you got into the wilderness but now you realize that these the the croaking the the, the odd sounds are actually coming from the figures and as they get close enough, you see that they're they're armed and armored. They actually are surprisingly well armored for what you expect, um, covered in black armor. And you actually see on one of them the 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 clenched armored fist of the crusader, and they begin to charge. So, I know frogman. It's so just, so just, to clear, just to be clear, we're being attacked by armored frogmen in the service of the Crusader Fist of the Dark Gods. Yes, that is okay. exactly correct. All right. So, so, so Tuesday, in other words. Uh, yeah, more or less. All right, let me get you all on here. Let me fix your HP real quick, and then we'll have you all roll initiative. And you can uh, you can go ahead and position yourselves where you'd like, uh, I'm just dragging your your tokens on willy-nilly, but you don't have to be necessarily in the place where I put you. And all right, yeah, I'll be on way the heck back here. I like yeah. my blue hair. I will disable the grid because we don't need that. And with that in mind, everybody go ahead and roll initiative. Mm-hmm. And I will have to roll initiative for my people. Are we just rolling a d20? No, there's, a, there's uh, an initiative uh, tracker on your sheet. It's right yes. under decks. And the way that works is you click on your token, and then you hit the initiative button, and it will roll it and automatically add it to the turn order tracker. And one more. And then I have to make my rolls. Sorry. So. <laughs> oh shit, <laughs> Tristan's <it's> dead boy. <laughs> wow. Are they, are they riding on tiny unicycles? <laughs> Damn you, frog memes. <laughs> Watch him rolling. Watch him go. <laughs> no tiny unicycles. Uh, that you can see. I can't find an issue. <laughs> Uh, it's okay. So on the top, the top of your sheet, you have your stat layout. It's like your strength, your dex, your con, all that. So right under where it says dex, there's a box that you can't tell it's a button. Oh, there it is. Initiative. Just click that thing. Thank you. 
Okay. Ooh, boy. My initiative, my dice and rolls have not already been good today, but we'll see. I, I disagree. They've been fantastic. <laughs> I'm sure I will make up for it later and crit all of you to death. But we shall see. Okay. So, uh, 13 Dages uses a mechanic called the Escalation Die. Uh, and what will happen is it will start at zero. And at the start of every turn, it will go up by one to a maximum of six. And what will happen then is you guys will add the Escalation Die to all of your attack rolls. So as, you are, as the fight goes on, uh, you will have an easier and easier time to hit. Uh, for the most part, uh, players are the only ones who get the Escalation Die, though there are certain enemies, like dragons, who also get to use it. But uh, at the moment, top of round one, Escalation Die is at zero. And uh, Dolores, you are the first one up. All right, I'm going to uh, quickly pull out my bow and arrow, and I'm going to try to shoot... Uh, looks like number two is the closest to me. Frogman Horde 2. Yes. Right. So you don't need to worry about range. Uh, what Great. will happen is uh, there are three basic range increments for 13 days. You are either engaged mm -hmm. right up on somebody within melee range. They are nearby, which means that you can reach them with one move action. Or they are far away, which means that you can only reach them if you move twice. Um, as it turns out, these guys are all uh, nearby you. So if yeah. you were to move, you could reach them if you wanted to. I'm going to stay back <laughs> for the moment. And, uh, and I mean, they're within the range of my short bow, right? Yes. Yeah. So you are attacking Frog bow, Frogman Horde 2, is that right? Yes, I am. Okay, yeah. so, and you do a 20, uh, 22 versus AC, which will hit, and you do 12 damage, yes. um, which is enough, in fact, to kill that one. So go ahead and describe how he dies. I shoot him. I laugh. He's really Frogman. And the arrow goes straight through his chest comes out the other side, and I hope with a watery, gross rivet, he sort of just slumps down and collapses. It's pretty impressive uh, shooting an arrow all the way through the dude. Right? Because <laughs> that Hercules. Especially from a halfling. Setting the bar high. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> Don't get in any bar, bar fights with Dolores. That's, that's <laughs> what that says, really. Okay. Uh, next, the Frogman Commander... Uh, seeing that you have uh, already taken down one of his his uh, people, he gestures to the the frogman uh, and actually hits him in the back of the head with his baton, and uh, the the frogman moves forward uh, with a a pained croak. Then the frogman commander takes out. It looks like a looks like a crossbow. It doesn't look like it's been very well maintained, but uh, it's at some point it used to be a pretty decent weapon, probably given by the, the Crusader. And uh, he takes a shot at uh, Hildebrand, since you are the farthest forward. Um, this is going to be versus AC. And will miss horribly. Um, one thing I do for my games, it's not necessarily part of uh, 13th Age uh, in particular, but on um, a natural one, uh, if for players, I give them a, a hard choice, that they, they have a couple of choices where um, they neither one of them is good. Um, sometimes it might be hitting a, an enemy in the back. Um, sometimes, it, I mean, uh, hitting an ally in the back, it may be losing the weapon and so forth. Uh, for uh, enemies, however, usually they just shoot one of their own people in the back. And, and in this case, that's exactly what happens. He he pulls out his crossbow to, to shoot at Hildebrand. Maybe he slips in the mud, and uh, he puts the crossbow bolt right in the back of uh, Frogman Horde 3, which I believe might be enough to kill him. Uh, not quite enough, but, but he... 
he does not look like he's in terribly good shape, having uh, been speared through the back by his own commander's crossbow. And that is the end of the uh, the commander's turn. Throndir. Throndir. Yes. Uh, I will. I will show these frog people the ways of my magic. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna huck a ray of frost at the frogman commander. Is that a thing I can do from the distance I'm at? Uh, yeah, you can. Okay. Cool. Then I shall. Let's do it. Pew. All right. 12 versus PD will unfortunately miss. Ah, but ah, you still do do a little, a little cold damage anyway, on, even just, on a miss. It's like a tiny bit. Just it's like a tiny bit of damage. All right, yeah. So like, yeah, I definitely make it try to make it look like I meant to. It was a warning shot. I was trying to frighten him. Yeah, and he's got an ice cream headache now. So That's right. Oh. Yeah, there's more where that came from. All right. Anything else from Throndir? Do you want to move or anything else? Uh, yes, I will stand over here a little bit further to just, you know, tactically assess the situation from the rear guard. All right. That sounds good. Uh, Hildebrand, you are up. So uh, I am going to move up to melee with this frogman that just shot his friend. And attack with my great axe, because the Hildegild does not like puny frogmen. Yeah, get him. All right, 24 versus AC will indeed hit, and you do, wow, 17 damage. That is a considerable amount of damage, and he is now uh, considered staggered. Don't call it a great axe for nothing. Uh, which means he is below half his health. Um, it, is, some, it is indeed a great axe. <laughs> very great axe. You really knocked it out of the park. All right, so you moved. You've made your uh, your attack. Is there anything else that you can do that you want to do? Uh, besides wordless yelling at my enemies, I'm good. <laughs> All right. All right, and it's the frogsman turn, and he is. Uh, going to try to spear Hildebrand with his, uh, well, spear. This is going to be versus AC. Uh, 16 versus AC. Does that hit Hildebrand? Uh, don't know. Maybe. Let me see. Uh, do, 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 do. I have AC 16. So, yes. Okay, so, yes, it does. So, you'll go ahead and take 7 damage. Okay. Yeah, if you could just go ahead and take that, just put that on your sheet, you take your seven damage. Just that's I, fine. I, I, okay. <laughs> How many hit points do you have, tough guy? Four, 44. Oh, oh, I got 44 hit points. All right, fine, fine. I'll just stand over here with my 32. Hell, the guilt feels no pain. Yeah, <laughs> get him. Been skewered, but not really feeling it. All right, end, end zone. All right, uh, Anselm has the Divine Domain of Leadership, which means that once per turn, when I make a melee attack against an enemy, my allies gain a plus one to attack that enemy until the start of my next turn. Mm -hmm. So that's going to happen. Uh, I, too, am going to charge this frogman. Saying, sorry, frogman, you're between me and your boss. And I make a melee basic attack with my longsword. Uh, 13 versus AC. 13 versus AC is not going to hit. Two damage miss. Yep. So despite all your bluster, you only managed to to nick him. I'm just getting started. Uh, anything else from Anselm? Uh, nope, I'm exactly where I want to be. All right. Toe to toe with the frogman. The frogman horde descends down upon you. Or at least some of you. So uh, we're, we'll first do the two attacks on. Uh, let's do Hildebrand first. So this is going to be. Quick. Uh, this is going to be versus AC. 
Uh, 17 and 16 versus AC, so those will both hit, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. All right, that means that uh, you will take two, you will take 14 damage in total. Okay. You can object all you'd like, Wade. It doesn't mean I'm going to sustain it. And then the two attacks on Anselm. Uh, 22 versus AC and 13 versus AC. Uh, my AC is 22. All right, so you will take one hit and you will take seven damage. Okay. All right, top of round two. The escalation die is now at one. So uh, I forgot uh, during my turn, I just noticed I'm supposed to be using my elf thing when I take an action where I roll a die to see if I get an extra standard action. Uh, um, you're so up, aren't you? Yes, I am. Uh, I don't believe High Elves have that. That should be Wood Elves. Yes, High Elves can teleport. Yes, High oh, Elves okay. can teleport. My, so my character has the wrong thing. I'll just copy it from the from the book. Oh, Grace. Yeah, no. Carry on. That's, yeah, that's my bad. Sorry. That's cool. That's uh, yeah, uh, yours is uh, once per battle, you can teleport to any place that you can see. Okay, cool. Yeah, I got it here. Yeah, High Blood teleport. Cool. Yeah, I'll just copy that over. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. Teleporting is way cooler anyway. All right. And with the escalation diet one, uh, Dolores, you are up again. Hmm. These slimy things. I've had enough of them. I am going to move backwards. <laughs> However, <laughs> slightly, I'm going to come back over here and hang out with Throndir, if I may. Uh... And I'm going to shoot Frogman Horde one because he is gross and slimy uh, with my short bow. So uh, does the escalation die work as a modifier, basically? Uh, what's going to happen is um, it's going to automatically calculate into your attack oh, roll. Oh, sweet. That's super easy. Okay. All right. And I hit him not very hard. Uh, but you did hit him. But actually, uh, yes. Uh, which one were you attacking again? I'm sorry. Frogman Horde 1. Frogman Horde 1. That should be enough to, indeed, yes, you have killed him. So describe how he is dead. I aim directly at his eye, and it burrows into his head with a squelch. Man, Dolores putting work in. Tasty. That being said, you are attacking the nobody monsters, so you're, you're trying to make yourself look good. They're like, maybe try to attack a target that's worth some Dolores. <laughs> I also have 28 hit points, so I am staying back here. And you are a wimp. I'm a delicate little halfling. All right. Anything else from Dolores? I just laugh. No. <laughs> All right. Frogman Commander will will move up a little bit, and then he will attempt to. Um, he's actually going to attempt to shoot Dolores, since so far you have done quite a number on his his uh, forces. That means that he doesn't like you very much. So uh, this is going to be a versus AC with his crossbow. Uh, Fourteen versus AC, probably. Won't. My my AC is fifteen. All right, so he shoots wide as he has to shoot past quite the scrum in front of him anyway. So um, then it is Throndir's turn. All right, um, I will. I will use. I will use magic missile. I will conjure forth that most iconic of spells and chuck some magical lozenges at my foes. So um, when I choose two targets to split it between, do I choose that before or after I roll the force damage? Before. Before? Okay, well, I'll just check them both at one, uh, one guy. Um, and I will target uh, this, this bad boy over here. That boy. Uh, Frogman Horde 3. Okay, yes. so go ahead and roll your damage. Okay. I deal him four damage. Four damage, which is actually enough to kill him. Uh, See, Dolores, I could do it too. You're not so special. Because the well, Frogman well, frog well, Horde are what we call mooks. Um, even though they're separate characters, they all share a, a hit point pool. So as you've been um, hitting them and knocking them down, you've been actually damaging them as a group. 
which leads to interesting things. Like if you managed to uh, hit them with a, a crit, it's possible you could have killed multiple uh, frogmen at the same time, which becomes really interesting, especially with melee characters, because then you have to, to go, well, I killed the guy in front of me, but the, the other guy kills way over there. So <laughs> how do I describe how I did that, which, which gets really interesting and really bizarre, but that's part of the fun, at least to me. Regardless, though, you have killed this frogman, so describe how he dies. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my magic missiles streak towards him, glittering like tiny stars, and uh, strike his, his squishy body, and uh, I think he, he just bursts. Um, but uh, yeah, it's all sparkles and rainbows. It's oh, like, he, he you know, burst bird everywhere. into chunk, yeah, it gets... It pops. And um, yeah, Hild Hildebrand, instead of being covered in like frog gore, you're gonna have like glitter all over you. Glitter frog gore. I'm into it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, no, nah, okay. I won't do that this time. Uh, anything else from Throndir? Uh, no, I'm good over here, kind of behind this tree. All right. Hildebrand, you're up. Uh, the Hildegilt will attack the frogman once again. All right, go to it. Sixteen versus AC, unfortunately, will not hit. Darn. So you will just do your two miss damage as you nick him. The, the does the uh, does the plus one make a difference um, from uh, from my thingy, the leadership domain? Uh, in this case, no, it will not. You need an eighteen uh, to hit the frog man. So you, he's he's a frog man. He's slippery. He's bouncing all around, even while he's in he's attacking you. And uh, yeah, just. Didn't quite get a good hold of him this time. And he is going to attempt to spear you right back. Can I use my building frenzy and just add damage to my next? Yes, absolutely. That's yes. how that works. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and then he will go and he will attack you with his spear. This is going to be once again versus AC. 16 hits. AC. So you will take another 7 damage. And then it is our unlucky one. Alright. Um, I am sick of these frogmen. So I'm engaged with uh, two horde members and frogmen, correct? Yes. Alright. Mm. And with my smite evil which I can use once per battle plus a, a, a three additional times per day. That means that I could use Smite Evil twice in this battle at least, right? Yes. Okay, super. Um, I, I deem these creatures evil. And I'm I was going to say, do they, do they have to be evil beforehand or is your smiting them make it so that they're evil? Like, it, it's you know, is is evil. We could talk about this all day, but <laughs> you know, frankly, I'm going to get to smiting. Talking, talking morality, relative morality with a paladin is something that, you know, it's you're going to be at it for a while, and there should probably be alcohol involved. I can't wait until we fight some nuns or something. And be like, yeah, you're going to use your smite evil. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. yeah, just evil do it. Nuns. Well, they are now. Yeah. Uh, all right. Frogman Horde 5 is going to be uh, uh, the person I'm swinging at in hopes of my longsword cleaving through multiple frog folk. Go for it. All right. Yeah, 11 versus AC. 11 versus AC is not sufficient. However, you do half damage, which I, I do. should be enough to kill another one. Yes, indeed it is. So describe how Frogman Horde 5 dies to your miss. Um, it, so it was not, I mean, it wasn't, really a miss. Um, it looked like an amazing uh, piece of swordsmanship that uh, caused his head to separate from his shoulders, but I am uh, I'm berating myself because I was actually aiming for his chest, and I ended up hitting him in the head. All right. That's, yeah, that's reasonable. All right. Anything else from Anselm? Uh, nope. I'm good. All right. The, the lone remaining frogman from the horde. He's he's not happy with you. You've killed most of his friends. So he's going to try to kill you right back. 
You know, he's, uh, he just has the wrong kind of friends. Yeah, seriously. This is the part where we leave him alive and he goes and turns his life around. Yeah, are you okay. going to have an intervention with the frogman now? Listen, dude. <laughs> I hope you've learned your lesson. Friends are a bad influence, so we killed them all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, 13 versus AC will miss uh, the paladin. So he's so distraught that he can't even stab you correctly. Uh, and then we go on to the top of round three. The Escalation die is now at two. Uh, Dolores, you are up. Yes. Hmm. I think that Frogman is looking like he needs to die. So uh, i still staying back, pretty far back here. Uh, I will shoot him. All right. Um, sorry, let me pull up my ranged attack. Okay, 26. Then that will definitely hit, and 14 is enough to kill him. Ha -ha. You have downed yet another frogman. Describe how this one dies. Well, he was already pretty weak, so he was, it, it was really pretty pathetic, actually. <laughs> uh, he just kind of folded into the arrow as it slumped him in the chest. And fell to the ground, and gave up. All right. And that's all that I do. Okay, so he is now no longer part of this battle. It's a nice euphemism. No longer part of this battle. Or, <laughs> you know, reality at large. <laughs> like, no longer with the company? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's moved on. He's gone to a better place. All right. The Frogman Commander... Seeing which way the wind is blowing, with a an angry croak, legs it, or hops it as it were, and is entirely gone, leaving his his one single subordinate left, which Thorndeer, would you like to end this? Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of want to chase after that stupid frog that got away, but, uh, yes, I think the smarter move would be to just magic missile this other guy and, and put him out of his misery. So I will, I will do that. I will hurl two sparkling magical globes his way and, uh, he takes three damage. Three damage. Three damage isn't quite enough not to kill him. But I have faith that Hildebrand can finish the job. Yeah, I mean, even if you miss, you'll probably off him, so. Okay, uh, so I stomp over, well, stomp onto this frogman that's down and swing at his still-living companion. With my axe. Yep. Sadly, you don't hit. Not the dead on, but it's enough to kill him anyway. So describe how he dies. So at this point, um, I am swinging wildly <laughs> with my axe, and just like like the rattle of all of the gold and whatnot in my beard is just echoing over all the other battle sounds. And somehow, in this like Tasmanian devil fury. <laughs> this frog gets swiped and dies. Nice. I, I'm not even sure if I notice it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the battle is now over. You have just blazed through these frogmen. You're not entirely sure how they found you or you have an idea of why they're attacking you, given that you've managed to upset the Crusader. And as mentioned before, you did see the Crusader's mark on uh, the commander before he, he ran away. But uh, some of you have different, ver different reasons uh, that the Crusader is now on your, is on your bad side. Um, Anselm, he uh, liberated a town from, from an extortion scheme, is, is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Um, I can't remember what the rest of you said uh, that, that you got into trouble with him with. A bar fight. 
He's just, je- uh, he's just jealous because I'm prettier than he is. That is undoubtedly true. You are yeah, considerably pretty than he prettier than he is. Yeah, he's mad. Okay, so the fight is over, but you still have your to make your make your way to green water. So, well, um, have these have these have these frogmen any loot upon them? Carry they any coins? Uh, they have a little bit of of money on them, not a lot. Um, out in the swamp, coin is not terribly useful, but they. They have uh, maybe a couple of gold uh, and about 35 or so silver. Do they have uh, any instructions or maps or anything like that that might be useful? None of these do, no. <laughs> they don't have any crudely drawn pictures of us with big red X's over them? That, that <laughs> no. was actually something that uh, the, the PCs found in one of my adventures. It was like, kill, kill. <laughs> just kill just kill. shitty drawings. Like, nah, kill all PCs. Kill, kill the pretty one. So they, yeah. they want Thorndir first. Do they, do have, they have anything? Dr- sorry. Do they have anything shiny or jewel like? Um, ring? give me a background check for that. Yes. Oh man, uh, background check is gonna take weeks, and you gotta like pay for it. <laughs> like... But you, I mean, you gotta be thorough. So yeah, go ahead and roll a uh, jewel thief plus wisdom. Gotcha. Wait. No. Uh, so what you'll do is you'll hit the radio button for the the background you want to choose, and then you'll actually click on the wisdom uh, up above on your character sheet where it says whiz. Sorry, I'm new to 13th age. I do not know where cool. any of this stuff is. Is this all on my character sheet? Yes, it's all on your character sheet. Okay. <laughs> I can see my backgrounds. I just I'm not sure how to click on it. Yeah, oh, yeah so you don't you don't actually click them. Yeah, there's a little radio button to the left. Yeah, so so you'll click on the radio button, and then you'll go up to above where your stats are, and you'll actually click the wisdom. <gasps> oh, right it there. changes the... No, okay. Oh, I gotcha. And and it's uh, wisdom, you said? Yes. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. That's all right. There we go. Seven. Uh, 17. They they have a handful of, of semi-precious jewels. Nothing really to write home about. Nothing that... <laughs> if you found them in somebody's house that you'd probably even take, but out here, that might be as good as you get. Well, if it'll keep me interested in the surroundings, I will take them and just pop them in my purse and kind of hope that nobody notices. So there are about a half dozen of them. Uh, None of them are probably going to sell for more than maybe 15, 20 gold at most, but it adds up. A lady never has enough pretty things. This is entirely true. All right, so you're near Greenwater, but you're not the you're not sure how close you are. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go around the table, and I'm going to have each one of you describe an obstacle or a danger that you uh, run into in the swamps here on the way to Greenwater, and then I'm going to ask another one of you to what you're do, trying to do to overcome that particular obstacle. So we will go ahead and start with the Wade. Describe on your way to Greenwater, what what situation, danger, obstacle, problem do you run into? Well, I mean, since we are making our way through the swamps, um, I've seen enough episodes of Scooby-Doo to know that quicksand is a very real danger. And uh, so, yes, uh, we're, we're tromping along, and some number of the party members find themselves suddenly sinking in deadly quicksand. Seems reasonable. All right. I nominate that some number is one, and then it's your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Mysteriously, I yeah. am one of them. I, yeah, I, weird uh, how that happens. Yeah. It, the unlucky paladin led you all straight into it, and unfortunately, you're he's the only one who did get caught in it. He he walked right over it, and you guys were behind him, so you all got caught in it. So, uh, Adam, how does uh, how do you get the party? How are you trying to get the party out of this mess? Um, by, uh, cheering them on, I guess. Like, I don't, I can't, I get, I'm fine. I just teleport out of that shit. So yeah. I'm like up in a bra- up on the branch of a tree somewhere sitting pretty, but yeah, like, I don't know. I, I encourage Hildebrandt to, uh, to, to pull herself free. And then if there's enough Dolores left above the mud, then we, we can, you know, put a stick in there, and pull her out. <laughs> She's the lightest, right? She just sink the slowest. 
Uh, give me an exiled prince plus charisma roll. Well, I've got. I mean, I've got. Yeah, exiled prince. If I'm. Yeah, cool. If I was doing it myself, I could use my like wasteland wanderer. But this is definitely like I'm. De I'm delegating. I'm like, all right, you're exactly. You're the you're the CEO of getting your ass out of the mud. So, um, I love how my charisma is eight too. For yeah. Me. You are you are the you are very unlikable exile. Oh yeah, the, the, the exile part is for a reason. Yeah, that's why you got exiled. So, all right, so I used to be you, Thrundir the delegator, but then I got fired. Uh, unfortunately, you are still not very charisma or very full of leadership. Yeah, no. You're you're mostly berating them for getting stuck and not being able to teleport. Like right, like, like a good alpha is like, why can't you just teleport? Why this would not have been a problem if you were all as excellent as me. Uh, so. Unfortunately, that does them no good whatsoever, and eventually they get they get pulled out, but not before they've in, inhaled a, a bit of of mud and swamp water and oh other things that that you really don't want to think about too much. So, that's how that's how you get frogmen. You inhale tadpoles and they hatch in your lungs. I know this. My mom told me when I was a kid. You got to watch out for that shit. All right, so uh, Hildebrand and uh, Dolores, you will both lose a recovery as you hack up along trying to get all this stuff out of your body. Oh no! And uh, so yeah, it the, the trip is not going terribly well. Uh, but now, Adam, you get to describe an obstacle or a danger or something that the party uh. runs into. Um, well, okay. So, you know, we're, we're traveling through the swamp and like, you know, are we, is there, I mean, there has to be like a road, right? Because we're going to a town, not like a, yeah, road, there, like there, a, there, a path. Okay. road. It's, it's not very well maintained. Um, yeah. in a lot of cases, it's just a mud path, but yeah, so, there, there's road. I think we get waylaid because, uh, Anselm feels the need to stop when we find a, um, uh, there's like a, a wagon of pilgrims. Uh, whose wagon has broken down on the side of the road, and we don't stop to help them. We stop because Anselm gets in a philosophical debate with the head pilgrim, uh, which which like drags on into the night. Uh, so oh, does, he, does he want to know what type of smite evil? It's, yeah, I mean, yes. I think so. I, I no, I keep I keep telling you that they're evil. We need to smite them and move on. And they're like, well, let's hold on to our frog horses here, and yeah. we need to discuss the moral implications of. Of smite evil. That's that's yeah. We get we get way way laid by by the dialectic and all uh, right. Stop so so Anselm seems intent on talking well into the night with these pilgrims. Dolores, how are you trying to break things off and continue on before you have to spend another night in the cold, wet, rain, rainy swamp? Uh, I'm kind of just complaining a lot, to be perfectly honest. Um. Yeah, are uh, I'm not sure what I'm doing actually. Um, so we're stuck with pilgrims and we're lost, and they're in a wagon. You could you could try to charm them into uh, uh, yeah. basically letting everything go, like following along with them for a while. You could persuade them to stop talking to the paladin because it's a fruitless gesture uh, whatever you'd like you could, you could I think I'm gonna out. I'm gonna try to compliment them into bewilderment and uh, just say oh you darling pilgrims you're so precious uh, all of your silly ways let's goodbye and just I'm gonna try to do that uh, that thing where you act like you're talking to somebody but you're totally saying goodbye the entire time it's like, oh this is delightful we have to go goodbye okay give me a other time give me a thief of hearts plus charisma check okay sorry let me pull that up and rolling it all right, 12. 12. Unfortunately, your attempt to kind of butt into the conversation doesn't go very well. You're, you're, you're very charming, you're very charisma, but they're very intent about talking about smite evil and the moral implications thereof and how morally relative that, that, that it really makes the, the ability. And they're having absolutely none of it. So... <sighs> So unfortunately, you guys are there until well after dark, 
and you end up making camp with the, the pilgrims and the conversation continues on and it's cold, it's wet, it's rainy, it's unpleasant. None of you really like the Paladin right now. So uh, let's see, you guys will all take... And Zom takes 1d4 feelings damage because nobody likes him anymore, apparently. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Uh, you'll actually take quite a bit of cold damage. Uh oh. Uh, you'll take seven cold damage. We'll you. die in our sleep. All of us? Yes, all of you. Even though there's a fire been built up, it's not really enough considering the cold and rain. And at this point, you guys have been on the road for a very long time and you really need a warm bed. So in the morning, you say goodbye to the pilgrims, some of you with more enthusiasm than others, some of them, some of you with considerably less tact than others, but nevertheless, you're on your way. So Suzanne, now you get to de describe an obstacle, a danger, or a situation that the party comes across on the way to Greenwater. Well, I think since we're all cold and freezing, that... Uh one or two of us might have gotten a little bit of f that damp frostbite. E. Yeah, maybe some extremities are feeling unpleasantly cold. All right. So with can that, you go with, you can go with like we just find a treasure chest so full of gold it takes us all day to count it. Is that you can? <laughs> come on, come on. I want frostbite. No, no frostbite. So, Nadja, how is Hildebrand trying to get past the frostbite and get everybody on the road so you don't have to spend another night out on the road? Uh, Hildebrand will yell at her party and she'll say, the only way the cold can kill you is if you stop moving and makes them do, like, warm-up exercises. <laughs> okay. Jumping uh, right now. <laughs> Give me a gladiator plus uh, either strength or, or uh, constitution. I'll roll it with constitution. Uh, oh. No, don't maximize. There we go. A natural 20. I said jump. Yeah, you said jump, but everybody was too afraid not to. <laughs> How high? I right. raised my hand as tall as I can, but I'm a dwarf, so... So not that high. I try to reach it. <laughs> okay, so... You are you guys are very much inspired or terrified by Hildebrand. And uh, pretty soon you're, you're on your way with incredible vigor and energy, despite the... Uh, the frost nipping at your nose. Uh, Aaron, Aaron, was her yelling at us so effective that in fact we have gained hit points? Uh, I would actually say yes. You guys can go ahead and spend a free recovery. Sweet. So can we you got, do this by... You can oh. do that in your character sheets. There should be a button that says uh, recovery. Got it. And that'll go ahead and roll it for you. In fact, at this point, you, you can roll more than one if you need to. I definitely do. Yeah, if you're below half health, you should you need to roll until you're above that. So that's 19 plus 22 hit points regain. Yes, you are. Nice. You you've inspired yourself even more than everybody else. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, good. Back to, back to full health. Excellent. Hildebrand don't care about no swamp. <laughs> Nope. At this, swamp, at this point, the swamp is second nature. So, about towards the end of the day, um, maybe late afternoon, somewhere in the four o'clock range, uh, you crest a small hill, one of the few dry places that you've seen in uh, recent days, and see down below you what you can only assume is the village of Greenwater. It's not a terribly large place, um, you expect that given the amount of houses within the, the wooden palisade, there are probably only maybe 150, 200 people there. Um, though there could be a, a number of people out uh, in the wilderness beyond uh, hunters, trackers, whatnot. And it's 
pretty much not what you would like to spend the night in. Um, it looks decayed. It looks decrepit. It looks like the town on the edge of a swamp. But nevertheless, it seems a much better option than spending another night on the road. Not, not to mention that this is where this artifact, whatever it may be, has been uncovered, and you need to find it. So as far as we know, the artifact is in the town? Yes, yeah. you, you know that it's been, um, it, it was fished up by the, a, a fisherman of some sort, um, and he brought it back to town where he, uh, where a merchant found out about it, and that's how word got back to the rest of the Dragon Empire, the more civilized part of the Dragon Empire. And I'm surprised nobody's rolled up on this place yet. I guess we better make sure work of it. True enough. So you enter through the gates. The, the guards the guards don't look terribly interested in, in seeing you guys. There's a bit, there's a moment of where they're going, who the hell are you people? And then eh, it's it's still rainy. It, they're un, they're unhappy. They're not really doing their jobs, and they just kind of wave you through. Um, before you get maybe more than fifty feet, you're met by something that seems entirely out of place. There is an elderly uh, elf man who is standing under an umbrella, and he is dressed entirely inappropriately for both the weather and the location. He's dressed like a, a court dandy almost, uh, except for some uh, much more practical boots that he is wearing. And uh, as he sees you, he motions over to, to, for you to, to, uh, to join him. A uh, friend of yours, Throndur? I like looking at him like, not in that outfit, he's not. <laughs> so as you as you approach, he the you can see that that he is smiling uh, in an unseemly fashion. He's he's tremendously happy, and as as he gets closer, he throws his arms around Throndir, and and says, "Oh, thank all of the gods, you're finally here. My exile to this snake hole is maybe about to come to an end." Uh, Who are you, and, and why are you touching me? Please, please stop. Stop touching me. He, he, he stops hugging you, but he doesn't take his arm off the, around your, your shoulder. And he's, he, he, turns, he, he turns himself and you to, to address the rest of the group. He says, uh, my name is Alistar, and I've, uh, I am a mutual of acquaintance of our... Uh, of our friend in shadows he i'm your contact for this mess such as it is uh i was sent out here a few days ago to get everything ready for you guys to show up and transport this back to someplace more civilized but please let's let's get out of this rain and mud and the the inn is Acceptable, but it's dry and acceptable. Dry and acceptable, just the way I like it. <laughs> what a charming idea. <laughs> so he leads you under his umbrella, which he has made no effort to share whatsoever, except with Thorndeer, who's he's still got by the shoulders. And he's res he's resisting every attempt for you to kind of of politely get out of his way. Yeah, we I mean this elf's gonna have a conversation about consent later. Uh, and, uh, Hildebrand will, because because Thrandir is is her friend, so she'll shove her like little dwarf body between the two of them, like <laughs> give him like a hairy eyeball. <laughs> he looks entirely entirely unimpressed with this, and he kind of just still leans over. He leans over the dwarf so he can keep his, his arm around. The, the, uh, we will yeah. walk into town that way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> As yeah. a little squeezable halfling, uh, Dolores just, wherever the umbrella is, she positions herself just underneath it. So uh, everybody's kind of mashed together except for the paladin. 
the, the, yeah, the Paladin is is a, a veteran campaigner and is is fine trudging through the mud and rain. But I would like, if I may, to use Imperial Soldier uh, to kind of scope out the town as we're going and just see if anything looks amiss or suspicious. All right, go ahead. Just, you know, I've been in hostile territory before and been looking out for ambushes. And- looking for suspicious stuff. I would begin with the town was built on a swamp. That's a good place to start. <laughs> that, yeah. Poor yeah. architecture yeah. choices. Is that a wisdom check? Uh, yeah, wisdom. All right. That would be 22. Everything seems pretty much as you might expect for a frontier town like this. There, there are guards kind of wandering through. None of them seem particularly alert, which uh, you can interpret as nothing, nothing untoward has happened here in a while. You don't see uh, any signs of recent attacks or other uh, problems aside from, again, being built on a swamp. Um, the walls and gates seem well maintained. Uh, they are made of wood, but in a swamp, being burned down is usually not the biggest problem you're facing. So everything seems pretty much like you'd expect from a, a town like this. Okay. So you are led through the center of town to a uh, stone building uh, with two floors, the only such uh, building in town that actually has more than one floor. Though you might guess that if any of them had two floors before, it just might have sunk. So uh, they might have a basement where the first floor used to be. And uh, you look up on the sign and it's called the Manticore's Tale. And uh, Alistar leads you inside and brings you to a table. Gestures for you to sit, which he doesn't even wait for any of you to sit. He throws himself down on a chair, closes his umbrella, sets it down and looks at you with a a sense of relief is the best way that you can describe it. It says, why did it take you so long? I've been out here for days and this place is horrible. Why did it take us so long to travel through the swamp? Well, moral relativism is why. I like cast a look over at the paladin. Moral Moral relativism. Uh, yeah, I do Also, frogmen. There are frogmen in the bloody swamp. I've heard tales of the frogmen. I, you say that they attack you. That's quite unusual. Usually they stay considerably away from uh, armed groups. They, they've been known to attack uh, lone fishermen, from what I've heard. Uh, but armed groups, that's quite unusual. Well, they are in service to the Crusader. The Crusader. The Crusader. Ah, uh, this job just keeps getting better and better. Uh, remind me never to rack up that much gambling debt ever again, even if it means not gambling anymore, because uh, this place is bad enough without the Crusader getting his mitts involved, in any case. So, the artifact. The artifact. I have not seen it myself, and that's a bit of a problem. Uh, the man that I was told had pulled this up uh, was a fisherman named uh, Boren, I believe his name was. Uh, I met him the first day I got here. He said uh, that I would be able to talk to him the next day, have it uh, handed over to my care uh, in anticipation of, of you arriving, and he immediately went missing. No so un- unpredictable, yeah. unpredictable behavior from this, this boring fisherman. Do you know him? Is this what he's like normally? I, I, I can't say personally whether he's no- normally like this. I mean, he may very, may very well disappear for days at a time like this. Uh, asking around town, to be quite honest, I do not have the best reputation around town. Uh, so few people have been willing to discuss the situation with me. Uh, I was hoping that perhaps tomorrow during the day you might be able to ask around yourself. At the very least, even if we can't find Boron himself, if we can take possession of the artifact, that's good enough for me. Well, maybe, maybe, he, ran, maybe he ran back off into the swamp. I heard this fisherman was Boron to be wild. And I can give you like the eyebrow. <laughs> 
I get experience every time I make people do that, Wade. Oh, okay. That's on my character sheet. He, he no, looks at you. Bar. <laughs> he looks and then at come you back five minutes. Clear the room. <laughs> yeah, uh, Alistar looks at you with a, an expression that's kind of like... <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a pun, he, Alistair. He, it's, he it's opens the door back at the Elven Court, where you, you obviously haven't been in some time. Those lapels are very last season, Alistair. We need to have a conversation about your attire. He he now he looks angry and yet still kind of stunned, speechless. He lo- he opens his mouth to speak and closes it repeatedly, as as he he shakes a finger at you, before just pulling himself together slowly with great difficulty, as you can tell. <laughs> Al- Alistair, um, all all elven sparring aside. Uh, it would be good to know where Boren lives and also where he was last seen. Uh, as for where he lives, he's got a, he shares a small uh, uh, house near the edge of town, near the wall. Uh, if you're looking to just go and check it out, I'm, I'm afraid I've already beaten you to that. Uh, I've already looked inside, and unless he's hidden it tremendously well, it doesn't happen to be there. I expect from what he says that he's hidden it somewhere in town. Once he realized the value of what he brought up, he didn't want anybody else to, you know, beat him to the punch. Not a lot of merchants come through here, but the possibility that he could sell to one of that, that somebody else could find it and sell to one of them. It, it's, it could have happened, I suppose was his thinking, but now he's, now he's disappeared, and I don't know if he's just out on a long fishing trip or been killed somewhere or, you know, just stuck in the mud somewhere. I, I mean, have you seen the mud? A bit. Far too much. It's just not right to send a man, a, a gentleman of my caliber out to such a place as this. It's unseemly, I tell you. But yeah, getting exiled is the pits. Um, where did Dolores? Where did you go? Are you? you are I you came still back up? in. Oh, you came back. Okay. I came back in. I think I actually at this talk of gentlemanliness, I t- I touch him on his arm. I go, it's it's so difficult. I understand your. He 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 pain. he puts his hand over your uh, your over yours and says, "Thank you. I'm I'm glad you understand my pain." At, at this horrific situation. Never in my life have I been so insulted and dishonored. Such a strong, powerful looking gentleman, such as yourself, it must be very difficult. It's, it is. I give, I give Hildebrand, I give Hildebrand the, the like, uh, Hilly, I give you the like, oh, this is how it's gonna go look, and maybe we just like slowly back off and try to disappear and go get a drink or something. <laughs> So, my dear, you seem quite refined in your taste as well. Would would you perhaps like something to eat or drink? Uh, uh, the food is qu- actually surprisingly good. The drink is considerably less so. However, it, it's it's something to to occupy our time and and mourn the loss of more civilized facilities. The Hildebrand would like a drink. <laughs> I, uh, I I wink there. at him and say, "Why don't you?" Show us all your, pick, give us the best pick of what this place has to offer. I, sh- I shall do so. But permit me to go up and make our order in person. Is there anything in particular you, you would like? And even though he's kind of speaking to all of you, he's mostly speaking to Dolores. I order one of everything. <laughs> <laughs> I hear the duck is quite good. I would like mm-hmm. to try that. If you have a rotisserie chicken, I'm always in fan. I take, I take, I take some umbrage at all this attention Dolores is getting, and I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not into being around this situation while it's happening. You know, not, we should, uh, Hildebrand, we should find someone for you to fight so we can make some money. Let's go pick some fights with some fishermen. All aboard that, yeah, absolutely. Uh, as, as if on cue. Yes. The door opens, and a number of rough-looking individuals head inside. And Alistair, with a, a sigh and a rolled eyes, says, 
Well, I suppose that that was inevitable. Those are the Big Eye Gang. It's bandits, thugs. They're as far from civilized as you can imagine, and I imagine, and I suspect that they've heard that we have newcomers in town, well-armed newcomers at that, and they're coming to be a jerk, for lack of a better term. Well, you know, it's like the same thing as prison, right? We show up in town, we got to beat up the toughest guys, so they're right on time. There, it looks, uh, there's a steady stream of them in. Uh, the, uh, there's a, in the end, it looks like there's about eight of them that come in. Um, you see one of them head up to the bartender and ask some questions. And the bartender, uh, with a kind of a resigned look on his face, points over at you. You know, speaking of prison, um, I've been in prison. And uh, I'm wondering if I could use that background to kind of size up uh, who the leader of this gang is. Yeah, go ahead. Like, and, and who do we need to hit hardest and first? Exactly, where to, where to aim the alpha strike. Yep. Uh, that would be a 19. A uh, 19. Yeah, you've got a pretty good idea of who is very likely the uh, the ringleader of this whole mess. There's a, a human male, um, taller, broadly built, um, definitely has the indications that he's been in more than a few fights. The, the broken nose, the cauliflower ear, uh, scars here and there across his face. Um, he was the one who was talking to the innkeeper when it was all said and done. All right, I, I kind of lean over to my compatriots and, and mutter squash face over there's the leader. Hmm. Well, I will, I'll stand up and intercept him. Um, I assume he's trying to come over to us after the innkeeper pointed. Yeah, it, it, he, he motions for, for all of the, his, his compatriots to come in, and uh, they're all heading your direction. Yeah, I will intercept, and I, I'll do, like, my signature move where I kind of wag my head like this to make my beard jingle. <laughs> I'll say, you got, you got a problem with the hill of guilt? He looks down at you and says, yeah, I kind of do. But uh, let's talk to all of the your little group, stunty, so I don't have to repeat myself. Can I, like, just take a swing at him? Yeah, do it. <laughs> yeah, you totally can. Um, I don't know how to make an unarmed attack. Uh, just go ahead and make a melee basic attack. It's okay. it, the, the damage... Actually, hold on, let me do this real quick. It won't take a sec. Zero. D4. Okay, now you have an unarmed attack. Aha! There we go. I think I rolled the right thing. You did. 24 versus AC is definitely going to hit. Uh, I and... take my little dwarven fist and punch him in the crotch. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at the innkeeper like, this is what you get, you snitch. This is what's going to happen to your bar. Everything snitch. snitches. Exactly. Maybe. There's going to be a fire where your bar was very soon. All right. So... So he goes down with this kind of moan in just utter agony. He goes down, just curled into a ball. And one of the other thugs says, they took it down Big Eye. Get them. And we're apparently going to have a fight. Yeah. So let me fix your HP because I didn't know if you were going to actually get into a fight. And then we'll go to it. The hill the guilt always fights. I will be happy when this that bug is fixed. All right, so let's have everybody roll initiative. Plus 
three. My dice rolls suck really badly. There we go. All right, who are we still missing on initiative? Missing me. Sorry, I'm clicking it. Yes. Nothing's happening. Oh, you you have to click on your token and then. Oh, hit. Duh. yeah. Sorry, I completely that, forgot. That's quite all right. Uh, it's it's a bit unintuitive, but because of the way the calculations work, that's how you have to do it. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, it's also in case you're playing a game where you have multiple characters for one person, then you roll them individually that way. That is true as well. Sense. Okay, top of round one. The escalation die is at zero. Uh, Dolores, you are up. Oh, those initiative rolls. Those are my friend. Let's see if that continues. Um, let's see. I'm hanging out over here by the patrons. Um, thug number three is, I think, the one that I'm going to deal with. So uh, staying in my current place in front of Alistair, Alistar, I think I'll, I'll make a show of standing in front of him while I draw my short bow and fire an arrow at thug number three. All righty. Let's see how that goes. 23. Sorry, 19. 19 will hit. Uh, 9 damage. So you've gravely wounded this particular thug. Oh. So, one. But uh, she is still up and fighting and if anything looks even more angry than before. However. Uh, anything else from Dolores? Um... <laughs> no, I'll stay in my ground. I thought about hiding, but I'll stay. All right, Tildebrand, you're already up in the thick of it. Yep. Um, I will run over and attack the three. Um, okay. Have they drawn weapons at all? They haven't had a chance to draw weapons, no. Okay. Um, well, we've already incapacitated one person to question, so I will draw my dagger. Okay. We don't need the rest of them. Twenty-two versus AC will indeed hit. Fourteen damage. Wow. I shank him. Yeah, pretty much. Yes. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, you actually tag shank. another one while you're at it. So you you've dropped. Uh, out of Thug 2 or Thug 4, which one would you prefer? Uh, thug 2. All right. Thug 2 also goes down. Describe how you do this, how you get both Thug 3 and Thug 2. You can move as a part of this. It's a narrative thing. Uh, I'll probably charge Thug 3, shank them in, like, the kidney since that's where I can reach. Um, and push them off of my blade so hard that they barrel into Thug 2. And All right, I like Thug that. Thug 2 smacks his head against the ground. I'll, I'll have him, I'll push him back over this way. So they've hit the bar. I like that idea. All right, anything else from Hildebrand? No, no. Just more beard shaking. Okay. Thrandir, you're up. All right. Um, so yeah, I, I stand up and like roll up my poofy wizard sleeves, crack my fingers, and start chucking magic missiles. But the whole time I'm looking at the innkeeper, like you see what happens, Larry. You see what happens. I'm just like, he, he's you. already he's got the face palm going on. Yeah, he's yeah. His head. You did this to yourself, buddy. Uh, so I'm gonna I'll, I'll take a I'll take a shot at Thug Four uh, with my magic missiles. Alrighty. Uh, okay, four damage. Four damage. All right. They are knocked backwards, but otherwise still, still up okay. and moving. All right. Um, and then I will get out of Anselm's way so that you can uh, you can go run in and do your thing. And I probably, yeah, I probably like as I as I walk forward doing the finger guns, I turn to Anselm and I'm like, well. <laughs> He just shakes his head and shrugs. I got this. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, thug One, or at least what remains of Thug One's group, which is not many, actually. So Thug Four is going to attempt... He's gonna, she's going to hop up on the table and then jump over to uh, attack the old wizard. Thug Five is going to move up to Hildebrand. Um, but we and we will resolve that one first. So uh, they pull out uh, daggers, and uh, first attack is going to be against Hildebrand. This is going to be versus AC. Uh, Seventeen versus AC, which That's a hit. Uh, you will take four damage. And then the second attack uh, against Yield Wizard, also against AC. 12 versus AC, I don't think even hits you. No dice. All right, just, you will just take... barely, though. Like, yeah. just like, just by that much. All right, you'll, you'll take two damage on the miss. Okay. As, they, as she slashes your pretty face just wow, a my, little. My beautiful face. You've, you've cut that's your... The that's the money maker. You've cut yourself shaving worse, but it's but they made you bleed your own blood, and that's, that's right. just not right. Yeah, that blood belongs to me, not the floor. Exactly. Though, given looking at the floor, people a lot of people have made donations <laughs> over the years. Yeah. Uh, Anselm. All right. Uh, Anselm is going to charge uh, Thug 4 and say, Get away from our wizard! And attack. So Anselm likes everybody, but I'm not sure everybody really likes Anselm. It's, That's fine. I like the dynamic there. Uh, 23 <laughs> versus AC will definitely hit. Eight damage. Uh, and yep. you will definitely put down Thug 4. So describe what you do. Uh, let me see. Um, I... Uh, you know, it's just, it's a very, uh, it's a very clean strike, uh, forearm extended, thrust through the heart, um, with such force that it pins them to the wall, and I wrench my blade free. They start to smoke as they're, they're next to the, the fireplace. I also start to smoke, I need a cigarette after that action. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> All right, anything else from our paladin? Um... I nope nope I'm good for now. All right, the other thugs pile in and start going after everybody. So one of them comes up to Hildebrand. Uh, the, a couple of them run over farther. This one, yeah, this one can make it to Anselm. Uh, thug nine, he's going to go over after the wizard. Thug ten, they're going to go after. A lot of people don't like Hildebrand right now. So we'll do the two attacks on Hildebrand first. Uh, once again, versus AC. Uh, yes, both of those will hit. I don't even need to, to check. Um, so you are going to take uh, 10 damage in total. I'm sorry, uh, 12 damage in total. Okay. Uh, then we will do the attack on Thorndir. Uh, Thorndir, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, 14 versus AC. Okay, so that, that one hits me. All right, you will take four damage. Okay. Uh, against the Paladin, 24 versus AC. Just hits. So you will also take four damage. Okay. And lastly, against uh, Dolores. Yeah. 25 versus AC. Oh, definitely hits. So you will take four damage as well. Ouch. All right. Top of round two, uh, the, the escalation die is at one. The patrons and, and other employees kind of make themselves a little scarce. So they, they, they just try to get a little bit away from the fighting. Uh, Alistar sits there uh, admiring Dolores in some fashion. You're a bit busy with the fighting part of it to, to, to not be sure whether he's admiring your backside or the way that you're fighting. Hmm. <laughs> but in either case, uh, it is Dolores' turn. Well, I've got some things to deal with. Um, still striking a heroic pose. 
I draw my dagger and try to knife Thug Six directly in front of me. So we'll see how that goes. All right. Here's my melee. Okay. Uh, 24 versus AC will hit. Excellent. Six. Okay. So you leave a gaping wound in Thug Six, but she's still up and angry. <laughs> How rude! Uh, anything else from Dolores? I just sort of taunt her. Yes. Come at me. Bro. <laughs> All right. Hildebrand, you're up. You have many playmates. I do. Um, I am going to pull my great axe at this point, since they seem like they really want to mix it up. And I will attack with it. All right, which one are you attacking? Uh, start with the five. Okay. Uh-oh. Eight versus AC, unfortunately, will not hit. And then I will use Unstoppable to heal after... Wait, no, that's after a hit. Do I have anything... Building Frenzy? Yes, you can use Building Frenzy. And I will add to my damage on my next attack. Yes. Uh, anything else from Hildebrand? Um, no. I think I'm good. All right. Throndir. You have a very ugly human in front of you. Aren't they all, though? And also, don't talk about Anselm like that. Um, I'm going to use my teleportation magic. I'm going to use my elven high blood teleport. I'm going to put my ass right over here with all these fine ladies drinking Patron in the corner. Um, so, yeah, with a, a, a puff of pink smoke, I vanish from where I'm standing and uh, reappear uh, over in the corner here. Um, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to hurl a, a ray of frost at Thug Nine. Let's see if I can ice cream headache this guy. Okay. So yeah, like I appear and I'm like, ladies, and then I laser the dude. Uh, so let's see if I hit. Eighteen uh, speed. Eighteen versus PD will indeed hit. Yeah. And you've done uh, ten damage. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you've given him a terminal. Ice cream headache. That's right. Describe how it looks. So I like, yeah, I, I shoot him the beam, and it, it comes out as like a white, uh, a white beam. Um, and uh, yeah, I think he just like freezes solid, and then cracks and shatters into a bunch of tiny thug-shaped ice cubes. And I probably like say something cool like "chill out" or like "ice to meet you," and like look at the the patrons like, huh, huh, yeah, magic. I got that. They they look at you in horror, but you're not sure from what. Right, that's normal. They just it's fine. Yep. All right. And um, my 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 ray of frost. Uh, it it tastes like it tastes like a white freezy. That weird like white flavor that no one knows what it is. It's that. <laughs> that's that's why it gives everybody an ice cream headache because nobody can identify it. Straight. All right. Uh, from the first group of thugs, Thug Five is still attacking Hildebrand. And we'll hit. Uh, you will take uh, six damage. Okay. And then it is our unlucky paladin. All right. Uh, I am going to go ahead and make a melee attack against Thug Seven. For 24 versus AC. Yep, that's a uh, natural 20. Dope. For, so for double a, damage, so that gives me three damage. For a whopping six damage, that is the that's best it. critical yeah. hit I've ever seen. Uh, awesome. Nevertheless, it still kills him. So Because these are moves, as you might have guessed. I, so I, I, just, I just put enough effort behind it to kill them. I knew exactly how many hit points they had. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else from... Uh, from Anselm. Uh, then Anselm is going to use a move action to, um, let's see, jump up on the table and I want to get in on this party right over here. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, with okay, that so, in mind, so I, down, I down the mook and then leap over their body and onto a nearby table. Yes, though though they're halflings, so you don't have to leap, leap very high. So, well, it's good because you're wearing like some pretty heavy armor. So, all things considered, yeah, I, I, I kind of hop over them. You leap leap over small halflings in a single bound, but only if they're very small, you know, like <laughs> slightly on a, smaller than usual. On, on the lower side of the the average. Uh, all right, the thugs are uh, not having a good time of it, but they're going to see if they can take down Hildebrand. So two attacks versus her uh, again versus AC. I screwed that up. Let me do that again. Uh, 20 and 23 versus AC. So they will both hit and you will take another 12 damage. Uh, it's at this point I should point out the rally mechanic. I, honestly, I should have pointed out earlier. As a standard action, uh, you can uh, spend a recovery and heal those hit points. Um, as a dwarf, you actually have a, a racial ability called uh, Is That Your Best Shot? Which at any point you can uh, use, you can spend a recovery. Um, if the escalation die is less than two, you don't get as much from it, but uh, you can still heal immediately after taking a hit. So you can do that now, or you can just wait to turn and rally, or do both. It's up to you. Uh, in the meantime, Thug Six is still attacking Dolores. Oh, goody. Uh, and will miss horribly. Uh -huh. uh, she's very distracted by that that gouge you've uh, made in her stomach. I think I, I look at her missed thing and I smirk at her. All right. All right. Uh, top of the next round. The escalation dies at two. Uh, Dolores, you are up. I am knifing this thug six with my trusty dagger and I will maybe floor her. We will, we will see. And a 21. 21 is indeed enough. So that will... All right, so describe how she goes down. Aha! Um, I think that when she missed, I get, let it pause for a second. I let a pause go by. W looked at it, kind of looked at her, laughed, and then knifed her in the ribs and laughed in her face that she died. All right. Uh, anything else to, you want to do, Dolores? No, I'm good. All right. Hildebrand, you are up. Um, so I would like to do several things. The first one is attack Thug 5 again. Okay. Uh, do, do, do. Just, I don't even need to, to look. Describe how he goes down. <laughs> um, I just take my great axe and cleave him in the side. Just chop him in half. Okay. Uh, and then I would like to use Unstoppable to use a recovery mm -hmm. for 17 HP. Mm-hmm. And um, what else? Can I also rally? Uh, no, because a rally takes a standard action. Okay. And you used your standard action to attack. Oh, okay. Got it. Um, and then I think... No, I can't use anything else. So yeah, I'm just gonna cleave that guy and get like super turned up about it and get some health back. All right, sounds good. Uh, uh, just as, as an aside, if anyone is uh, is really hurting um, and you're worried that the next hit is going to off you, uh, I have an ability called Bastion where I can soak up half of that damage if they hit you. So just keep that in mind. Thanks. Just wave at the paladin. <laughs> it's like gotcha. <laughs> uh, all right, Throne Deer, you're up. Some of the some of the women have deserted you, sadly. It's okay. They just can't handle my magic. Um, well, I think the only thug in in visual range for me is ten. So um, 
I will, I will give Anselm a, uh, a helping hand. Um, and uh, let's take the gamble. I'll fire the, fire the Ray of Frost uh, over at 10. All right. Okay. Let's see here. Yep, 19. Yep, 19 will hit. 12 cold damage. Oh boy. All right. Uh, describe how your, your freezy beam... Yeah, yeah. So it's even, it's like, I don't even cast it again. It's the same beam, right? Like I'm shooting a thug nine and I like yell to Anselm. I'm like duck and like swing it around. <laughs> uh, so it's just one long continual like spray. I'm like a Diablo wizard. And uh, yeah, and you like, I don't know, a duck or jump out of the way or whatever. You've, we've done this. We've played this game before. I jump, I jump in the air and it goes under me. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> it just goes under yeah. you and I just blast it right across their chest. And then they, they freeze uh, in the same yeah. way. The and night. then I land and kick them in the chest and nice. they shatter. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Perfect. All right. Anything else from you? Uh, no, I'm, I, I mean, one of the patrons is still here, so whatever, I got company. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. I give, I give uh, that patron a look like, yeah, you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> she, she doesn't, she looks like she doesn't know what to think because on one hand, that was kind of cool. On the literal and figurative sense. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, uh, she might have known who these people are, and you just broke them. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. All right, uh, Anselm. All right, what do we got here? Um, it looks hey, like uh, there's not much left. It looks like uh, Thug Eight um, needs some attention. Actually, is Thug Eight the only one who's left? That is correct. He is the only one who's left. Okay. Here's the thing. <laughs> Here's the thing, I say, uh, looking down at Thug 8. Looking around, it looks like you're now a gang of one. So um, maybe we can settle this peaceably and you can uh, tell us what we want to know. What do you think? Or... We could settle this the uh, the hard but enjoyable way. I shake my beard. <laughs> Menacingly. He looks down at the beard. He looks up at you. He looks down at the beard again. Drops his dagger. Just... That's right. Good choice. Ah... <sighs> See, normally, normally this would be the part where we would like, you know, interrogate this dude about like, why did you attack us and all this? But really, we're just like, yeah, now you're all your friends are dead, and we run this town. So, and, and, and we we kind of started it a little bit. Exactly. Just, I mean, they they were being shady. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. Actually, they were being antagonistic, and you guys escalated. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have a specific die for escalating. That's what we do. We escalate. <laughs> Uh, but maybe the most uh, charismatic and beguiling member of the party can uh, can ask this thug uh, what they know about the artifact and where it might be. Hildebrand steps up. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly. Yeah. Um, you want to take a shot? I love it. No, do yeah. it. The innkeeper, <laughs> the innkeeper is like, you have to help me get rid of these bodies. I get a. I'm. I guess yeah. I'm. I'm too far away to assess the innkeeper from this distance. But I'm making my way over to the. Yeah, you the party. can't see him, but you can definitely hear him yelling at you. People going, I can't believe you've made this mess. I have to. It, the stains just uh, adventurers. Damn. Just throw the bodies out in the swamp. Just I don't care who does it. Just somebody. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk over to the bar. I'll handle the bartender. You guys do the thug. So I'm gonna walk over to the bartender and I pick up like one of the human ice cubes from the floor and I just like lean over on the bar and just like plunk it into a drink in front of him and be like, "Oh, good sir, you started this when you pointed those thugs in our direction. You see, this is how we operate. Things are bad, we make them worse. So I look around. I'm like, find some scullery maid or what have you to tidy up this place before we come back." We're going to go have a conversation with our new friend. I look around. I'm like, I think we've improved the decor, actually. He looks at you, and he's, he's a little bit green at, at the, the glass with the, the chunky bits inside now. And he's just, after all, he just shakes his head. He puts his, his elbows 
on the bar, hands in face, uh, and just just shakes his head. Shakes his head. <laughs> That's how we do. <laughs> you gotta. It, it's you're doing murdering right. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there's a bar. There's gonna be a fight eventually. There's a potential for a fight in a bar, anyway. All right, so you guys are interrogating the lone remain thug, our new lackey. Uh, yeah, your new minion. <laughs> what are you gonna name him? Thug eight. Filet Mignon. Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his name is Phil. His middle name is Aloysius. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll saunter over to join <laughs> uh, Hildebrand. And the dear, how are we going to explain to this new friend of ours that he needs to he needs to give us some information. What would you suggest? Should we stomp on him, perhaps? He's like, I, I don't know what you want. I, I don't care what you want. I will tell you anything I know, just as long as you don't kill me, or actually, you can kill me as long as you don't do that ice thing, because that was just wrong. It's pretty weird. What? I'm a nice guy. Everybody likes me. Come on. Even he gives you a look at that one. <laughs> going, it, it, the look says, if you're going to kill me, just do it. <laughs> Stop your thumbs, please. Listen, Phil. There's a fisherman here in town named Boren, and he found something. And we've been sent to retrieve it. Know anything? Oh, that thing. Uh, yeah, I guess I can tell you about that. It's, I don't know what it is, but yeah, everybody heard that he found something in a ruins out in the knee deep and he brought it back to town. I, I'm guessing that's what you're here for. Besides killing my friends, of course. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not in his house. I think it's in a warehouse. Uh, along the wharf uh, He's put stuff there before he's got a key to the to the lock. So if I had to guess it's probably there Shall we go Yeah, 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 yeah I, 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 I would love for you to go I, <laughs> I, I, I'd be more than happy for you to go and everybody all the patrons around are kind of going. Yeah. Yeah <laughs> I would love for you to go <laughs> <laughs> Alistair stands up and go then let us venture forth to the wharf and get the hell out of here because they're starting to get that one by the fire is starting to get a bit unpleasant smelling uh, I, I'm <laughs> sorry I, I didn't know you were invited Alistair <laughs> I'm inviting myself miss I like put my arm around like one of Throndir's legs and like <laughs> <laughs> Walk out of the bar. Yeah. He, he uh, Alistar looks a bit put out at that, but but he he opens his umbrella and and with a little <laughs> bit of a sad expression, he he follows you guys out. Yeah, let's go check out this wharf. It's it's a small town. It's not terribly far or difficult to find this this warehouse and the on the wharf. Um, it looks like it's actually built over the swamp. Uh, there is a boat tied up uh, just outside. Uh, doesn't look like it's uh, anybody's been using it recently since the water from the rain has uh, built up a considerable, considerable amount in the boat. Um, but so, and it otherwise looks abandoned. There's no lights in from in, lights inside the uh, the warehouse. Uh, as you reach the door, it seems to be locked. So who does this, who does this warehouse belong to? Uh, you actually don't know. Well, why don't we ask our new friend Phil, or whatever we decide to call him? Uh, Phil. I assume, I assume we're dragging him along, right? Like, well, you, you have to. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. He's part of the party now. That's how yeah. it works. Phil gets to hang with us now. Yeah. Whether, whether he likes it or not. Friends, Bill. Stronger friends. 
That's right. You're moving up the chain. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> so he he looks at you guys and says, it doesn't really belong to any one person, um, but the, a bunch of the townsfolk use it for when they've got stuff and they're waiting for, for merchants to come by. Nice. Oh, great. Got a key? Uh, no. How sound does the door look? Uh, it's, it's made, it probably used to be more sound later, uh, or earlier, but it's been sitting in a swamp for who knows how many years. And as such, it's, uh, it's not in fantastic shape. Is there no. a pat? Sorry. I was going to say, I'll take my ax to it if there's no other solution. Yeah, well, let's, I mean, uh, yeah, this is, this looks like a job for uh, our little skullduggery master over here. Do you want to try to pick the lock first and then we can break the door down if you fail? Yeah, I was wondering, is it a, like a thick iron padlock on the door? Yes, yes it is. Uh, can I inspect it and see if I, or can I just actually just try to pick that lock? Uh, you can do either. You can in inspect it or, or try to pick it, whichever you'd like to do first. I'm going to go straight up and just try to pick it. Straight to business. Yeah. Uh, would that be dexterity for yes. Jolty? Yes. Great. All right. I get an 18. Uh, the rock's a little rusty. Uh, the lock, I should say, is a little rusty. And it's not in terribly good shape either. So it's not too hard to, to pick it and get it free. Uh, and open the door. I do it quickly. Throw open the doors and then stand back and look very pleased with myself and preen a little bit. It's, it's no right. big deal. Easy. Who wants to go in first? Uh, Anselm will go in first. Okay, who wants to come in behind Anselm? Me. Okay. And third? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm following, uh, I'm following Hildebrandt. Which means okay. that... Dolores is hurting Phil. Nice. And Dolores prints after opening the door. We just we just walk, <laughs> okay. walk straight in. We don't. We really don't appreciate it at all. It's... The preening is more for me than anything else. <laughs> all right. So the warehouse looks like it's filled with a number of different things. Uh, there are bags of what you can only assume would be seafood. There are crates filled with un. Uh, the things that you can't tell, you're pretty sure that's that's one of these boxes here somewhere is the artifact. You, from what you understand, it's something that one person can carry, so you can automatically rule out all of the the bags and all of the bigger boxes. It's just one of the smaller boxes. Hey Phil, did uh, Boren have a mark that he would put on uh, his his belongings to so that they wouldn't get mixed up with anyone else? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, he did. Do you see it here? I, yes, I see it here. Hold on. Phil has a bad attitude. So, well, yeah, Phil, you need, we need to, we'll talk about it in his quarterly <laughs> review. Um, so, so Phil heads to the, the, the far side of the warehouse and he look, looks back over his shoulder and says he usually stuck his, his stuff here. Uh, but I, I guess it's over here. I, I might not be, but. And from below, you hear this uh, a creaking sound, not like the usual creaking of, of wood, uh, the wharf, or, or, or even a building in wind, but something like, like wood cracking. And before you even really have a chance to, to process that, an enormous hole opens up in the, uh, the warehouse uh, right below Phil. And up from that hole jumps at least one familiar froggy face and another one that's not familiar but considerably larger. Nice. Look at that gigantor beast. So with a, a, a croak, an angry croak, the, uh, the frogman commander from earlier points at you and in his own froggy language, you imagine he tells the frogger to uh, 
attack and kill you. That ogre, that ogre should need us. It should be our henchman. He's much more filling. Stop it! <laughs> Phil is. I, can't. I leave. Phil is <laughs> no. in the water, you know, and he says, "I heard that." <laughs> Uh, we're just trying to fulfill right, his destiny. All right, everybody, go ahead and roll me in if you okay. And him. Are we? Uh, are we supposed to wrap up at noon? Yeah. Do we? Do we have any leeway, or or can we go over a little bit? Uh, I thought this game goes until 12... Yeah, this game goes until 12.45. Yeah. Can we oh, also? okay. We're fine. Yeah. I was just double-checking the schedule, but yeah, we're good for an hour, almost. I was thinking, otherwise, the Froger uh, might uh, explode in 10 minutes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll wrap this up fast. Yeah, we're actually going to wrap up fairly quickly, but uh, we'll have enough for this particular fight, at least. Nice. All right, uh, let's see. Um, top of round one, the escalation die is at uh, zero. And the Frogman Commander is up first. He he got the jump on you guys. Pun somewhat intended. <laughs> let's see, what's he going to do? Mm, no, he's not gonna do that. So he's gonna take a crossbow shot at. Let's see who who was worst last time. Dolores was the worst last time, so he's gonna take a shot at at the halfling way in the back hmm. with his crossbow. Uh, twenty three versus AC. Ooh, that's a hit. He is a bit of a sniper, it would seem. Uh, so you're gonna take five damage. Okay. And you are going to be hampered. Save ends. And what Hamper does is that you can only use basic attacks. You can't use any special abilities until you've saved. Okay. That's fine. All right. And that's his turn. Next up is the... Actually, that's not the way that's supposed to go. There we go. Uh, next up is the Paladin. All right. Let's get busy here. Uh, first off, I'm going to invoke the divine domain of leadership, which means that I increase the escalation die by one. That drives me nuts and you know it. <laughs> I, like I, you have an, I like you have an ability that just escalates the situation just by being here. Like just exactly. things just get more intense because you're around. Uh, so yeah, everyone kind of senses that uh, it, it's on now. All right. Uh, and then I am going to rush the Froger and I'm going to smite evil because clearly. Be careful, the Froger is also cursed. It's <laughs> <laughs> clearly. But is the Froger really evil or is he just misguided? It looks evil. We'll find out know. if he gets smote. Wow, yeah, that, that's, that's, how, that's how these things work. You smite a thing, and if it is smoten, it was obviously evil to begin with. And if not, it gets to go to Frog Heaven, where it belongs. I think, I think Wade needs to go back to Paladin School. <laughs> I, I think I should teach Paladin School. Yeah. Uh, ah, 11 maybe, versus AC. Maybe Crusader Paladin School. Uh, all right, but you do miss, but you do half damage, so. So that would be uh, what he call it, didn't it? Alrighty. Uh, anything? Actually, no. You can't do anything else. So, uh, Hildebrand, you're up. Hildebrand will charge in as you do. Yeah. And swing her axe as you do. Uh, and I wouldn't have recovered any health between the bar and this place, right? Um, actually, I can say that you guys would have taken a short rest between then. So go ahead and uh, roll a recovery and add that in. Cool. All right. Okay, so let me roll the recovery first. Okay, that's... And everybody can do this, obviously. Basically yeah. back to full health. Okay, I will attack... With an axe. 
Let's see. 19 versus AC. 19 will hit for 16 damage. Ah. Okay. All right. Anything else from Hildebrand? Um, how do I trigger raging? I have to. I can't do that because I attacked. Uh, no. In that case, in this case, you can. It's only a quick action to uh, to start raging. Okay. And I will start raging. All right. So next turn, you will roll two d20s for your attacks. Okay. And go from there. All right. Um, it is the Froger's turn. And let's see. Yep, he can do that. Oh, damn, I should have done that. Eh, never mind. That's my bad. All right, so he is going to make a, a huge jump, and it's, it's attempting to, what you feel, knock the both of you right there back. Um, so this is going to be an attack against Hildebrand and uh, and uh, the our paladin. And we will go and uh, just a sec. There we go. Oh, sorry, slightly distracted. Um, this is going to be versus physical defense on both of you. We'll start with uh, Hildebrand. Uh, 12 versus PD. I don't think that's going to hit. And then against Anzum. Uh, even worse. Fantastic. Yeah, Frogman. So he jumps, but you guys withstand the, the force of the blow. Uh, and then he brings his... Looks like he's got a, a giant femur in his hand. And he brings it right down on top of... Uh, Hmm, who does he bring it down on top of? Wade, evens, or odds? Even. Odds, Hildebrand is getting smashed. Well done. Well done indeed. Uh, this is going to be versus AC. Uh, 19 versus AC. That hits. All right, so you are going to uh, take 14 damage. Yeah. Can I uh, recover that with my... The, is that your best shot? Yes. Yes, yes you can. Nice. So you'll roll a recovery, and since the escalation die is only at zero, um, you'll only get half of that back. And I can only... Oh, I can only use that once per battle, so I'll hang on to that. Okay. Uh, Aaron, the escalation die is not at zero. Yeah, it's, it's at one. It's at one, uh, but yes. But uh, nevertheless, it's still not oh. two, two or more. My smugness is wasted. <laughs> I, I will put an escalation die out there so I remember. All right, there we go. Escalation dies at two. I, I'm sorry, one. I dragged the wrong one. I'll go with two. No. <laughs> you're not that lucky, Wade. In fact, in fact, it's in your character name. You are not. You are unlucky. Yeah. What was I thinking? <laughs> uh, all right, Dolores, you're up. Uh, she might not be back. I'm still muted. Um. Hmm. It might be time for me to rally. I don't have much uh, HP, so I think I'm going to go ahead and do a recovery. Okay. Go ahead and roll your recovery. You can still move, and you still do have a quick action. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, okay, well, I went ahead and rolled 11 for recovery. Okay. Um, great. <laughs> so that's actually perfect. That uh, gets me a little bit over back to my max HP. So that's very nice. I will move... <sighs> is it uh would it be one motion for me to move up to the frogger or is it going to be two motions uh one yeah you can reach it then i'm not gonna do it yet <laughs> okay i will do it next time uh for now i just i mean i ready my crossbow my uh short bow okay go ahead and make your saving throw against uh the hampered and yeah. all you're doing for that is rolling a, a straight d20 and you need an 11 or higher Okay, great. Let's do it. Oh, I got a four. All right, so you are still hampered. I'm going to put an icon on here to indicate that. Oh, dear. That'll do. 
Uh, and that is the end of your turn. So, uh, Throndir, you All are right. Right. Uh, Do I need to, I have a question about uh, evocation. Do I invoke it, do I evoke it before or after the roll? Uh, before. Okay, all right. Um, and then it goes away whether I hit or not. This is the maximize the damage dice on a spell that targets uh, physical defense. Let me look real quick. Okay, cool, yeah. I just wasn't sure if I needed to say I wanted to do it now or if I could roll the attack and then be like, oh, and then I evoke it. Uh, I usually treat it as you have to do it before, but let me look it up real quick. I want to take about a second. Sure. Evocation... Before, before, yeah, you do have to do it before. Okay. Yeah, yeah, before rolling for a number of targets or making a tech roll. Okay, mm -hmm. spend the quick action to evoke it. Hit or miss. Oh, hit or miss, you max out the spell's damage. Okay, cool. Uh, that was the part that wasn't clear on my sheet. So mm -hmm. uh, I, will just, I will just do that then. Um, and I will evoke on my uh, acid arrow, I guess. Okay. Um... So, do I need to roll, or do I, do I just deal the, the full damage? Uh, you still need to roll. Okay. Uh, there still is a potential of missing if you roll a natural one. Got it. Okay. There we go. You, you would have hit anyway, so... Cool. Uh, so, max is... Four, max is 40. 40, okay. On the Froger, correct? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Oh, man. Evocation right. is nasty. Evocation oh, is really nasty. Um, he is now staggered and very nearly dead, as far as you can tell, as your acid arrow just doesn't burn a hole right through him. But if there's much still left in the way, you you don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now I can I can only do that once per once per battle, and I can only cast acid arrow twice per day. So that was a big that was a big uh, use of my abilities. That one. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else from uh, Throndir? Um, no, I'm good where I am. All right. Top of round two. The escalation die is at two. Uh, I think it's the Frogman Commander is already in a bad shape because you've just destroyed his Froger. Um, but but is he? Yeah, he's gonna. He's angry enough about that that he's going to come up and whack the paladin. Sounds good. Hey, and uh, and and also, um, I noticed the escalation die that you put on the board. Um, maybe we should give a shout out to the artist uh, Ixne, uh, who did the art for that. Yeah, yeah. that's super cool. Nice. And, uh, they are very cool. There's one for it's originally it was a paper craft, mm -hmm. but uh, I uh, cut it up and made it for made it digital, and it is yeah they all look fantastic. If you do a Google image search for uh, escalation die art, then uh, you'll find it. That's really the, cool. the physical escalation die is really cool too. I got one at Gen Con. They're like a big D6. They're really nice. Yeah, the, the, the giant D6s just feel better as an escalation die. Yeah. yeah. yeah All cool. right. So with his baton, the frog commander is trying to whack the paladin and does actually. Uh, 25 versus AC. And you... He oh. whacks you so hard you go stumbling backwards. Dang. Not that it really matters a whole lot because it's now your turn anyway. Uh, how much damage did I take? Or is it, uh, is it just the effect? 10 damage. Okay. Mm, dislike. So when you when you come staggering back towards me, I'm like there right behind you, and I just like put my hands back. I'm like, get back in there, tough guy, and like I give you a shove. From down below, you 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 hear a faint voice going, "I'm still down here, guys." Shut up, Phil. <laughs> okay. Nobody right. really likes you, Phil. Be quiet. <laughs> All right. So uh, so yeah, Throndir uh, pushes me back into the fight. And um, I, ah, that was really annoying, but I would like to uh, finish off the Froger. Right okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. Let's see, is there anything else that I, that I could possibly do that's cool? Um, Paladin Heat. I think we're good for now. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, and whack at it with my longsword. Okay. 16 versus AC. 16 versus AC is going to miss. Two points. Two points. Still not enough. 
You're really close, though. Yeah, I was really rattled by that whole baton thing. Yeah, Farkmander just just clocked you on. Yeah, out of nowhere. Uh, Hildebrand, you are up. Hildebrand is muted. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so I want to swing at the Froger again, um, and I'm raging. How do I trigger that on my sheet? All right. So you're gonna make you're gonna make two melee basic attacks. Okay. Got it. And we will take the first one as your damage if you do crit. Twenty versus AC will hit. 15 versus AC will not hit, but they're both 11, so you crit and do 34 damage, which is 32 more than you actually needed to do. So describe how you mow down the Froger. Uh, he's laying on the ground, and I will take my axe and just swing it down into his open mouth and cleave his head. Along along the hinge of his jaw. Ooh, that sounds painful and deadly. All right, so the Froger is now dead. His massive corpse slowly falls backward and nearly lands on Phil. To which you hear ex him exclaim, "Hey, watch it! Look out, Phil!" You're like. You hear him muttering down there that nothing that seems terribly complimentary to any of you. All right, Hildebrand, it's uh, you still have a move and a quick action. Uh, ooh, what can I even use my quick action for? Um, I guess did I already use Unstoppable this battle? I feel like I did. Uh, no, you didn't this battle. You did the last one. Okay, then I will. Um, make my way over to the commander and use Unstoppable to recover. Okay. Nice. Okay. I'm done. All right. Dolores, you are up. Yes. So I'm still hampered, right? Yes, you are still hampered. Okay. No worries. Um, I'm going to shoot the frogman commander. And... Yes, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. So, there we go. All of 14 versus his AC. Uh, 14 versus AC will miss. And uh, for the most part, ranged attacks, unless they specifically say, do not do miss damage. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, but this so one does. It's a miss one. Two. This one does. It does say. Uh, because you're a rogue. Like, if you were doing this as, like, a fighter, uh, you wouldn't automatically get it. But in this case, you do. Wonderful. All right. Um, Frontier, you are up. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to... Uh, I'll use my other... Uh, I'll use my other acid arrow on uh, the commander. Okay. So here's hoping... That I hit him. Yeah. Yes, you do. And so 23, 23 now and take five and call me in the morning. Going. Okay. Yep. So that's okay. And he is staggered and he is taking ongoing damage. Cool. That's what you get. Messing with me again. All right. Anything else? You still have a quick and a move. No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine playing artillery from back here. All right. Uh, Escalation die is now up to three on round three. And uh, the Frogman commander is not in good shape. But he's, he remains and it looks, it seems like he's just trying to bring one of you down with him. So he tries to smack... Uh, the Paladin with the Baton again. Uh, 24 versus AC. That's a hit. Uh, so you will take 10, 10 damage and once, ago, once again go knocked flying backwards. Crashing through a stack of crates. 
Yep. Covered in fish. Covered in fish that, that's been sitting there maybe a little too long. So angry. Uh, roll me a saving throw real quick, Wade. What? Um, I would be happy to. How do I do that? Uh, type in forward slash roll. Oh, okay. 1d20. One, two, two, one, two, two, oh. no. You get it. You get to sample the fish internally, as it were, because as you go flying back, the fish magically finds its way into your open mouth. It's unpleasant to say the least. It's not as bad as that time you had fermented cobalt milk, but it's close. That's pretty bad. I keep telling you, man, you got to be careful. More careful about how you pick your actions. You can just run around doing shit for the halibut. Yeah. It, oh. No. God. No. That just. Well, that's the convention, everyone. <laughs> I, yeah. Good thing his turn was over. Uh, sorry, all I, right. I, needed, I needed a moment. All right, and now it's it's your turn, uh, Wade. Okay, good, 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 good. Uh, boy, am I sick of this guy. Um, I'm going to smite evil. You're not sick of him. You're sick from the, the fish guts. <laughs> that's, well, just I'm, so you know. just, I'm just sick. Just plain sick. Uh, so yeah, I haul myself up out of the wreckage and fling myself the Frogman Commander, screaming the war cry of the Imperial Regiment and smite evil. What the hell? Oh well. However, I still I, do half damage. See, this is really what you get for calling your paladin the unlucky. I because know. Because you maxed out the damage, I think, uh, at least on some of the dice for this, you've done <laughs> 20 plus damage, but you've not hit any of it. Thankfully, I'm smiting evil, so 10 points. Still do 10 points of damage. All right. It's the great horrific cruelty of rolling your damage dice at the same time you roll your attack. <laughs> it is really, yeah. No. Uh, all right. And then uh, Hildebrand, unless uh, Anselm has anything left to go. Okay. Yeah, do it. All right. Um, I am going to continue to rage and swing wildly with my axe. Finish him. You don't finish him. Not with that attack, anyway. Uh, the 15, actually, yeah, neither one of them will hit. So I'm you... blinded by fury. Yeah, apparently. Uh, so you'll still do your two damage from the miss, but he is still up and kicking, and actually, no, that's not true, because I forgot he he was taking ongoing damage, uh, and this would have killed him if, if he'd taken that ongoing damage. So instead, describe how he dies from your missed attack. It's, it's another one of those, like, Tasmanian whirlwind things, where there's just a lot of jingle and jangle and swinging of the axe, and when I stop, probably dizzy. He's dead on the ground, and I'm like, yeah, that's what you get. All right. So he he has gone to join his froggy ancestors in the, the great pond in the sky, or the swamp, or hell. We don't know. I don't think any of you, you are experts in frogmen mythology, so you'll just have to wonder. But in any case... With Phil, Phil, right is about the time you're killing him. He managed to drag himself back up into the warehouse on the corpse of the Froger, and he looks over at you guys and says, "Just it, he looks like he wants to yell at you so very much." And then he just shakes his head and starts walking away. Where are you going, Phil? Where are you going? Hey, yeah, Phil. Like, I've had enough of you people. I've. I, I've had enough of everything. I don't care if you kill me at this point. I'm going home. Yeah, and only now, after we've broken him, do we allow him to leave. <laughs> like, good. <laughs> yes. You understand now. You have shattered a man, which is even worse than actually killing him. Exactly. Own way. I mean, he's useless now. Yeah, it doesn't take you too long to find the the box with the artifact, considering it's one of the only ones that it's left over here. You You pry open the box... Uh, a glowing light meets your eyes and we're done. Sweet. 
Yay. Yay, we got the thing. You did, and then we indeed. proceed to do the like Zelda thing where we just smash all the boxes. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> I spend the whole rest of the adventure rolling around in here, smashing crates. There might be coins. You never know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're done a little early. Uh, we can do some Q and A. Uh, we can do. Hmm, I'm pretty much up for whatever um, that you guys are. We can take questions from chats about system setting whatever yeah that's not a bad idea i noticed earlier uh some folks are asking in chat about how much of the setting is is like built in and how much like we made you made up for the adventure how much we were like introducing like you know how much of like because obviously like the icons are kind of like a built-in part of the game but mm -hmm. what else uh what else is like built in and what what's allowed for the players of the game to, to feel it's like? built it's built roughly as a loose framework um there are details um, about things like uh, some of the the like the, the great cities, you know where they are, you know what they are. But a lot of the smaller cities, you don't have information on. Greenwater is something I totally made up. Uh, there's just a, a little bit of detail about a number of places so that you can hang your own campaign off the framework, make up what you need to. And yeah, let's let's take a look at that. Take a look at that big ass map again. You want to take us back there? Sure thing. I think people that. are people are pretty into into that map. Yeah, the designers uh, call it a half finished world. So there's uh, there's just enough description to get you started, and whenever there is more detail about a place given, like in the uh, the first supplement, thirteen true ways, uh, it's always positioned as here are some suggestions for what this city could be like or this region could be like but it could be completely different it's all it's all about options and whatever is good for your group mm -hmm. yeah it, it's it's a setting where deliberately it's it's built in that if you need to contradict something that's written you should contradict something that's written you're supposed to make it your own campaign and if that means changing around the city changing around the setting you're encouraged to do so as you uh, as you look at the map, you'll see that on some locations there's a symbol like Shadowport has that kind of squiggly heart looking thing. Necropolis has that sort of strange cross, and so those are the symbols of the icons. They're tied to a geography, so this mm -hmm. is kind of the, their power base is at this location. Yeah, they're not limited to that. So I mean, just because the emperor is an axis doesn't mean his influence wouldn't be felt in, say, Horizon or uh, even Dragonhall. Uh, but that's that's where they're primarily uh, located. Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about what the how the icons work in the game because we we talked about them a bit as like influencing like sort of patronage for our party, and we had one that was our enemy. Um, how does that how does that work in the uh, in the mechanics of the game? Uh, well, Wade is actually probably the better one to to go into this because I don't I don't use them as written. Uh, I still use icons in the games I write um, and and run, but I don't use them the way that they're written in the rulebook. Which admittedly is one of the uh, the nice things about the icons is there's a lot of ways you can use them. But Wade, I, I'm pretty sure you use them as written, right? I, 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 I use the icons a lot. Um, I wrote up 13 icons for Cobalt Press for the Midgard campaign setting. Uh, and I helped write a section in the uh, 13th Age Game Master's resource book about how to use the icons in your game. Uh, so yes, it's a mechanic that I absolutely love. Uh, at first it seems weird and a lot of people are really challenged by it. I know that I was, it's like, how do you you know, how does this, how does this even work? So the icons um, are 13 very, very powerful individuals that are kind of fantasy archetypes, like the Lich King, the Elf Queen, the Dwarf King, the Emperor, the Archmage. Uh, they sort of represent these kind of RPG tropes. And so this kind of gives you the freedom to, again, customize them however you want, you know, whatever you want the Archmage to be. Um, that's, that's kind of what he or she could be. Um, when you roll up a character, you get three points to spend uh, on relationships with up to three of those icons and their resources that you can draw on. So they're not, then they don't have stats or anything. It's, it's not like they're NPCs who could be, you know, pillaging the dungeon themselves. Uh, they are more like, you know, the president and the Pope and, you know, um, you know Bill Gates. You know, these would be people that whose effect is on the world is considerable and maybe you're connected to them somehow and can leverage that relationship 
but it's, uh, you know, you're unlikely to run into them um, at any given moment. So yeah, generally, as written, generally before an adventure or at the start of an adventure, the players will roll a d6 for every point in an icon relationship. And on a five, they get a benefit from that relationship plus a complication that the GM will come up with. On a six, they just get a pure benefit from that relationship. Um, and actually, Campaign Coins just wrapped up a, uh, a Kickstarter uh, to make tokens that have a red on one side for benefit with complication and green on the other side for, uh, for just benefit. And there's uh, one of those for every icon, and you can still uh, get in on that on backer kit. So that's actually something you can hand out to the players, and they can cash in and say, yeah, I want to use that six to do this thing. And it's something, it accomplishes something significant that would be in, in a much more effective way than just a skill check, for example. Um, and you can also kind of use it to alter events or make up something on the fly about the world that helps you. Um, but there are a lot of other ways uh, to do it, uh, but that's the, that's the basic mechanic, yeah. Um, 13th Age Monthly, the monthly PDF series, uh, Jonathan Tweet, uh, did one called uh, the Seven Icon Campaign, where it sort of collapses some of the icons and merges them. So instead of 13, there's just seven. Uh, but yeah, so, so those are the big movers and shakers in the world. And the result is that during character generation, like we did, where we're deciding which icons we have relationships with, that actually affects the adventure and the campaign. So you could say, oh, well, three of you have a negative relationship with the Orc Lord, so the Orc Lord is the big bad for this campaign. Um, you know, three of you have a conflicted relationship with the Archmage, so there's going to be a lot of magic in this campaign, and maybe the Archmage isn't necessarily the good guy that he appears to be. So there's going to be some intrigue plus magic plus fighting orcs. So it's a way for the players to signal to the game master, here's the kind of adventure that I want to have. Here are the kinds of themes that I'm interested in, whether it's the undead or criminality or fighting orcs or fighting dragons or whatever. And that's how I, I tend to use them in my games. I don't typically use them on a session to session basis. I use them on a, a more meta level where you guys have these icon relationships and I'm gonna work that into the overall campaign. So at some point, if you have a relationship with the Lich King, you're going to run into something with the Lich King. I mean, he may not be the big bad, but he's going to factor into the campaign at some point. And I, for, just for the way I GM, that's a better way for me to work them in instead of having to go, well, you guys have rolled these relationships this turn. I wasn't planning on bringing them in and now I have to. I don't improvise to that same level. Um, so I work them in on a, an, on a higher tier, but I still work them in. And the, there's a lot of different ways you can do them. Some people do it more like I do. Some people do it exactly like Wade does. There's a number of, of different options listed um, in the GM screen of how to use your icon relationships. Uh, I also try to um, give a, a mechanical benefit to when I do icon relationships. So if you have a six, you get to add a D6 to any dice roll in combat, out of combat, whatever. If you have a five, you get to add a D4, but I also get to add a D4 to whatever I'm doing. So it, in that respect, uh, it's a little more, it's a little easier for players new to the system to understand it because it's a more concrete benefit. If you're using it um, strictly for narrative benefits, a lot of players who aren't used to having that sort of agency, that sort of control, they kind of freeze. They, they're not sure what they can do, how they can do it, and giving them a mechanical benefit, even in, even if it's this case a house rule, uh, I find that players tend to be a little more proactive in using it, and they'll come around to the idea that I'm influencing things, and now I can influence them more narratively. I can declare that something is true. I can declare this thing about the setting or the situation, not just I'm adding a dice to my attack roll because I have this benefit. In a recent, uh, in my own campaign, uh, during a recent climactic battle, things were going very badly for the players, and one of them used his five with the Crusader to say, basically send up a, a, a signal flare and say, look, hey, Crusader, we really need help. Please come. 
police had reinforcements. And so reinforcements teleported in, but the complication was that then the crusader took over the city, which um, is not necessarily good for the forces of, of good and is something that is gonna kind of come back to bite them later on in the campaign. Yeah, I could see in a long-term or longer-term campaign having a kind of way of tracking the uh, the icons and their struggles with each other uh, on the kind of like macro scale if you zoom out from the PC's action, kind of like um, Stars Without Number does the faction turn. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, I really like uh, the skill system in this in that there isn't really one. Uh, how it's all kind of like wrapped into into backgrounds again not something that necessarily the the folks watching would have been able to see can you talk a little bit about how the how the background systems work yeah absolutely so instead of having a set skill list uh 13th age has what are called backgrounds and they represent uh experiences talents things that your character um has and can call on in lieu of, of a particular skill. Uh, the example that I usually use is you might have a background called city guard. And what that means is that whenever you would be doing something that a city guard might, uh, such as interrogating someone, um, chasing people across rooftops, um, searching for clues in an environment, you would use that as your skill. So uh, all of your backgrounds have a, a number rating associated with them um, uh, between one and five. And you would use that as your skill. You would roll in the typical D20 fashion. You'd roll your the D20 plus your your background plus your level, and that's how you would do. do that's how you do skill rolls in uh, 13th Age. And there there's a lot of flex with it. Um, and it's one of the things I if you asked me with my favorite thing about 13th Age, it would be backgrounds because they are so flexible and they are they they add to the game as you use them. So it's like I don't like say you've got the city guard background and you're, and you're like, well, I don't know if I would have done this as a city guard. I, as a GM would go, if you can justify it, if you can come up with a situation as a city guard where you did something, absolutely, you can use it. And it also fleshes out your character's history too, because you're telling everybody at the table, I did something like this in my background. And that might be something that can be drawn on later, either by the player themselves or the GM. If you, um, if you learned how to interrogate people by by de dealing with a notorious serial killer in uh, Shadowport, then maybe that serial killer comes later back up. The GM can go, well, he got away, and now you have to deal with him again. So it, it, it expands not only your character, but it expands the setting uh, in a way. Um, in my campaign, uh, during character generation, the paladin uh, gave himself a background of uh, plus for Imperial Inquisitor. And I did not know until that moment that there was an Inquisition in my campaign and that it was under the control of the Emperor. So the Emperor became a little more of, a, of an ambiguous uh, figure. And I read up on the Spanish Inquisition and figured out what the structure was and said, okay, so here's, um, here's how it works and, and here's what kind of resources are available to an Inquisitor. And it ended up providing the hook that explained why the party was together in the first place. And so, you know, that's that's something you're not going to get necessarily from a skill list, but backgrounds can be that powerful. And, and they and they tend to encompass the things that uh, other games you might have to quote unquote waste skill points in. Like if you used to be a blacksmith, um, you might not want to take like a crafting skill because you have you, you might not have a lot of skill points for it. But if you have blacksmith as a background it encompasses not just making things but everything revolving around being a blacksmith so it's not just the crafting but it's dealing with customers so you might even use it as a social skill you if you were uh putting shoes on horses uh you might be able to use that in dealing with animals or horses in specific so it's very flexible in that respect. If you can justify it to the GM, if you can say, yeah, I think I can use this as a skill here because X, Y, and Z, then it's absolutely usable in that way. And as I mentioned before, it, it expands uh, the setting and expands your character. So if you had a blacksmith before and you didn't know that you worked on horseshoes, but suddenly you need to, to calm down some horses, all of a sudden you did. It's, it's a, a bit of a retcon but it's a retcon that, that fits in entirely with the narrative control that the players have. And if you, and if you chose a blacksmith as a background, uh, I would come back as the GM and say, 
who trained you? Um, what, you know, is it, are you, were you the apprentice to the master blacksmith for the Dwarf King? And uh, then that expands the usefulness of that background. Yes, and I, and I tend to do the same thing as well. If, if a background sounds kind of one-dimensional or it doesn't sound really, uh, it sounds too broad, I'll, tend, I'll, I'll go back to the player and go, what, what more can you give me about this? All right, so we have our city guard background. It's in and of itself, it's fine. But maybe I go, well, what did you do as a city guard? Were you part of the night watch? Were you an officer? So you might end up refining that to sergeant of the night watch, which doesn't necessarily change it a great deal, but it adds to it and it makes it more evocative and it makes, more, it, makes it more fun uh, in play as well because city guard, if you're rolling that a lot, you're, you're going, well, okay, that's fine. But if you're searching to the city watch, it, it puts a certain image in your head, both as a player, as a GM, as, as well as the other players. You have an idea in your head what that looks like and that adds to everybody's enjoyment of the game. Cool, cool. Yeah, it feels like it feels like Thirteenth Age occupies kind of like a middle space between being the kind of like crunchiness of a of a like a forty, uh, and then like a more kind of like loose narrative space. Like it's a nice kind of in between for the two. Um, so, how much of what you were doing today in terms of like asking us to introduce uh, complications and stuff? How much of that is built into the game, and how much of that is just the style that you that you GM? Uh, it's a little of both. That's actually originated with the organized play elements. Or the, those adventures uh, had the skill challenges that are that are set up like that, where everybody will describe a challenge and then attempt to overcome the challenge. And I've integrated it into pretty much everything I do at Thirteenth Age, because it's a nice way of moving things along and, and keeping people interested without hand waving. All right, you travel and we're done that i want to keep the the travel and the experience of going through the wilderness uh or even uh just investigation i want it to be more than just a die roll or a hand wave and this keeps it uh interesting and it also keeps players uh invested uh themselves because they're coming up with the challenges that one of the other players has to overcome and sometimes people might come up with something that's specifically oriented towards another player sometimes they might just come up with something that's uh, suitable for the environment. Um, but it's not something that's built into the core rulebook. But a lot of us who uh, work with 13th Age have kind of incorporated it into our play styles and our design styles. So when I write an adventure um, that I'm not running, I tend to in incorporate the same thing. Um, because I just it, it, it has a good feel to it. Uh, it's it's a good mix of mechanics where people are rolling, but they're also getting to make things up. So the the supplemental material for the game predominantly expands it in terms of like new classes, uh, like new monsters. Like where where does where does that expanding out come from? Like I, I've seen I've seen read the core book, and I know there's the what, thirteen true ways uh, mm -hmm. that some of that stuff. There's also like adventures that are available. Like what. Uh, what other stuff is there for Thirteen Days? Uh, Thirteen True Ways is arguably the the next thing any player or GM. Yeah, it's the next big one. Hey? Yeah, because it's got yeah. it's got a little bit of everything in it. It's got a, additional classes. Um, the, the classes in there tend to be a little more mechanically complex. Uh, stuff like the Necromancer, the Druid, those are in Thirteen True Ways. But it also has a number of other things um, for like a GM. It has it has some small write ups about some of the different. Uh, uh, big cities in the Dragon Empire, and as Wade mentioned before, these are all set up as, if you'd like, this can be how this is. It's none of it's set in stone, this is how Horizon is, come hell or high water. It's all set up that here's your options for how Horizon can be, and you can pick and choose one or more of them. It also has additional monsters. Uh, Robin Laws contributed uh, a demon, was it demons or devils? It was devils. Robin Laws devils. wrote a chapter on devils. Which, which are very interesting, um, and they're very well written up, and it's got more magic items. It's, it's a bit of a grab bag, but it's a very well put together grab bag that has something useful for players and GMs alike. Um, uh, have, yeah, among, among the classes, I um, should mention, uh, so it has the commander, um, mm -hmm. which is a character that can, uh, can do things when it's not the player's turn uh, by spending command points, and so it, it adds kind of a very tactical element to the game that was 
um, kind of missing in the original core book. Uh, the Necromancer, as mentioned, which um, is a, you know, like you can have a burning skeleton that follows you around and follows your orders um, and things like that. And it's, it's a really kind of interesting char uh, character where if you give a, uh, like a cackling soliloquy, then you get, a, a, you know, an ability to do something. Uh, there's also the Chaos Mage, which is completely random and weird. Um, where you don't necessarily know what you're going to be casting next. And the occultist who messes around with time and space, um, and there is only one occultist in the world at any given time. So that class is the occultist. As well as the druid and the monk, which, uh, which were also mentioned and which have some variants. Mm -hmm. uh, as for other supplements, there, there is a bestiary. Um, it's got some very interesting uh, creatures in it. Uh, Ask anybody who's played 13th Age about the red cap and, uh, and <laughs> yeah, see how they're uh, it, the, the red cap's got a very meta element that I won't spoil for anybody, but uh, it's one of the most interesting uh, uh, monsters I've, I've seen, period, in a very long time. Uh, and, and then there, yes, there are a number of adventures. There is a mega adventure called Eyes of the Stone Thief, where you are venturing into... Uh, a living dungeon, 13th Age, the setting has uh, living dungeons. They bubble up from deep below the earth uh, and tr attempting to make their way to the surface. And they are every old school D&D &D module that never really made any sense in terms of layouts or monsters. In, in 13th Age, that's because they're living and they're just weird. They're, they're uh, impossible to describe and they're attempting to make their their way to the surface and breach the surface mm -hmm. the stone thief is a very specific uh, uh dun living dungeon who's actually attained a degree of sentience so it has its own goals it has its own mind and it goes around and actually will swallow up villages and bring them in, into itself and move all over the place uh, for its own inscrutable purposes and eyes of the stone thief you're running into the stone thief and you're trying to find a way to stop it before it ends up killing you or your family or your, your, uh, your village, whatever it may be. Um, it's, it's a very well-written book by, uh, Gareth Hanrahan. Um, the maps are fantastic, isometric, full color, lots of monsters in there. Um, and even beyond that, there's a number of other, uh, other adventures that, uh, that people can pick up. Uh, pretty soon we are going to be launching uh, one of those adventures here on Roll20 uh, called Make Your Own Luck. Uh, and we will it will have maps, it will have uh, tokens, uh, we'll have everything you guys need to play Make Your Own Luck here on Roll20. Yay! Yes. Sounds very exciting. Yeah, if you, if you go to go to uh, 13thH.com and you'll see uh, all of these uh, products and more in the sidebar, as well as uh, free downloads. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, does the chat have any other questions? Do you guys have any other questions? I actually have a question. I was um, thinking about, you mentioned this briefly while we were playing um, about the ways that the grid does or doesn't work, that, that mm -hmm. Comet doesn't really use a grid. So can you talk a little bit about how that works and the reason behind it? Uh, well, it's you don't necessarily need a, a, a map, a tactical map in 13th age, because as mentioned, there are basically three levels of distance uh, in a combat for 13th age. There's engaged, which as mentioned, uh, you're right up in their face, you're within melee range, um, you're right next to each other, more or less, or within a few feet of each other. There's, there's a bit of flex there. Then there's nearby. Um, mechanically, this is uh, described as any place you can reach in a single move action, which depending on the map may be a far way away, uh, a, a good distance away, or it might be someplace very short. Um, but you can always move to something that's nearby with a single move, move action. Um, many ranged attacks can only target something nearby. And then there's the last uh, range distance, which is far away. Far away means you're, you're barely on the battlefield, more or less. Um, if you took another move action away, you would actually leave the battle which is what the, the commander did in that first battle that we had. They, they got to the edge of the map and spent another move action, as so they were more than far away. And since you have those three 
uh, range bands, you don't need a map. You can say, I'm moving to engage this target and you are engaged with that target as long as you're nearby. Um, I prefer to use a map because I'm more visually oriented. It helps me keep track of where people are and what people are doing. But people can and, and absolutely do run 13th Age entirely theater of the mind's eye. Uh, no map, no tokens, no miniatures, whatever. Uh, because it's very straightforward in terms of uh, am I engaged, am I nearby, or am I far away from this particular enemy. And, and, and I'd like to... What one of the, one part of your question was why is it that way, which is a really interesting question about Thirteenth Age because Pilgrim Press gave Rob and Jonathan complete creative freedom with this game. Um, there was no there was no market strategy. There was a uh, you know no edicts from on high, no shareholders to please. It's just you do what you want to do, and which makes Thirteenth Age a very quirky game because. Uh, you know, when you ask why is it the way it is, the, you know, the answer at the bottom is that's how Rob and Jonathan like to play. And so this game is for people who kind of like the same kinds of games that they like. Uh, but, you know, with as the lead designers of third and fourth edition D&D, &D, you know, they're used to very kind of grid based uh, designing games with very grid based combat. But really, they prefer a more old school approach where it's much more flexible and you can just kind of you don't have to deal with a lot of different um you know factors in combat like who's prone who's flanked things like that they just uh, prefer very free form and, and winging it and so do i frankly so it's I, I really dig it nice oh aaron i think you're muted aaron is muted <laughs> he's been silenced <laughs> I am always so bad at that. Uh, <laughs> all right, any other questions from, from anybody from chats, from anybody here on the call? Any um, comments about anything? Hmm? All right, I think we're pretty much done then. Great. Cool. cool. It was a lot of fun. Yes. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Yeah. I, I had fun running the game for you. I hope you all enjoyed it as well as I did. So, uh, Suzanne, I know that uh, folks in the chat were looking for because we've been the the stream has our lovely faces and has the game, but it doesn't have any information about uh, the individuals in the in the chat. So, I know people were looking for you know how they can follow people. In that case. Indeed, should we all go around and uh, and say who we are and where we can be found on the interwebs or other places? Um, I'll start. I you guys have gotten to know me pretty darn well today. I'm Suzanne. I'm the brand manager for Roll Twenty. And uh, you will I, you will not see me anymore today, I think, which is very exciting. For me. Uh, <laughs> but I will be around for the rest of the day doing production and other stuff. So thanks everyone for watching and stay tuned for more stuff. Um, Wade. I'm Wade Rocket. That's uh, Rocket with two Ts. Uh, you can Google my name uh, to find me, but uh, probably a good place to start is uh, Twitter. I'm Wade Rocket on Twitter. Uh, and um, I've done some design work for 13th Age, so uh, you can find that on uh, Drive Through uh, RPG or uh, the Pelgrim Press website or Cobalt Press. I did an adventure called The Wreck of Volan's Glory and uh, worked on a Deep Magic with Ash Law, who's our uh, head of organized play. I have an adventure coming up this month for 13th Age called uh, Temple of the Sun Cabal. Um, but uh, yeah, follow me on Twitter. That's, I'll, I'll post all this stuff. <laughs> And Aaron, let's do you next. All right. Uh, for the most part, people can find me on Twitter and other social media as Wolf Samurai. Uh, I do have a Patreon where I make 13th Age stuff like additional classes, magic items, monsters, the whole nine yards. Uh, it tends to be a bit eclectic, but uh, the things I like to write about are a bit eclectic. Uh, I also have written, as Wade has, for different 13th Age products, uh, including organized play. And soon there will be another campaign city called Nocturne released by Savage Mojo that I've contributed to. Um, it's very Ravenloft-esque, so I hope people will give it a look. Um, I also stream uh, my own uh, 13th Age game on Wednesdays. Uh, usually every other Wednesday, we're playing an Eberron campaign. Uh, if people want to watch that, I do post links to that on Twitter, G+, Facebook, whatnot, uh, if anybody wants to watch that. Nice, Adam. 
Cool, cool. Well, this is not the last of me you're going to see today. It is merely the beginning. Um, so I'm going to be here for the rest of the day. I've got a panel about GMing, um, and then I've got uh, several games I'm going to run. So we're going to be playing some Dungeon World later, and then I'm going to close off the day with uh, Tenor Bancho Zero, which I'm super excited about. So make sure you stick around or come back for those things. And uh, if you want to, you can follow me on Twitter at Skinny Ghost, and I stream pretty much every day now at twitch.tv slash Adam Coble. So you can go check me out there. And last but certainly not least, Nadja. I am Nadja Otikor, AKA Tristray. If you want to find me, you can follow me on Twitter at Trist underscore C-H-I. I am also the DM for Miss Clicks D&D Prophecy. And you can watch that at twitch.tv slash misclicks. That's M-I-S-S-C-L-I-K-S. Um, and I've also started streaming Overwatch on the weekends. Uh, so you can follow me for that at twitch.tv slash Tristray. Can and should. Trist has awesome, salty banter. <laughs> plus, she, so plus she's, she's good at Overwatch. You're better than I am. So definitely go I, check I me mean, out. I do all right. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. I think uh, that is the end of this amazing game. We are going to take a step back. There will be a short break, and then we will be back with more amazing things. Up next, it's going to be the Advanced Roll20 and Looking for Game panel. So stay tuned for that.